name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Yes, there is power. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, oh, to break it, break every chain. God, you a chain breaker, yes you are To break every chain For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Okay, looks like we are live tonight on Standing for Truth. Guys, this one's going to be a lot of fun. I appreciate everybody's patience, but as you know, with these important debunking videos, I like to make sure I'm leaving no stone unturned. So this is going to be a very interactive stream tonight. Got a lot of visuals, a lot of clips. Uh, we are going to, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's, um, it's another evolutionist bites the dust. Uh, with Tony Reed. So Tony Reed is the next evolutionist who we are going to teach real science. <laughs> Godzilla Freak says, did you forget the Bites the Dust intro? Never, never. I wanted to leave you guys in suspense. That's the best part of this. Uh, definitely check out our previous um, 
another evolutionist bites the dust videos uh brother nicholas good to see you here says i wasn't patient i would have missed the beginning had it started on time nicholas it's a pleasure glad you're here like i said this one's going to be a lot of fun so make sure you check out our previous another evolutionist bites the dust of course the one dr rob stadler educates professor dave Poor Professor Dave probably wishes he never came out with that abiogenesis video. And good old dismantling Vice Rhino with empirical facts. Um, I believe, I know at least one person has reached out to Vice Rhino for a debate against myself. And he said no. And I don't blame him. Um, but guys, also a lot, uh, announcement-wise, we got some stuff to look forward to this, this week, tomorrow. We've got Otangelo. He'll be with us debating good old David Neff, intelligent design versus naturalistic evolution. So make sure you're here for that one. And this Saturday, nine o'clock sharp EST, Genesis flood debate. Derek Barnes versus Nephilim Free. So I'm really pumped for that one. Uh, Derek Barnes has been on the channel to debate Ken Hovind just a couple weeks ago. I've also debated him. So we know that that one's going to be one to remember. Um, and uh, obviously, Nephilim Free is no stranger to this channel and debate. So really looking forward to that one. Anyways, yeah, today is going to be interactive. We're taking on Tony Reid. Um, we're going to be debunking some other critics too with the, while we're going through it. Um, a lot of the same arguments. For example, from CRISPR, I've got a comment here that I'm going to flash on the screen in one second. CRISPR, he's a pretty well-known critic and evolutionist, so he's we're going to debunk his argument when it comes to mitochondrial DNA as well as evil grad. Um, I'm going to put this first. Fair use disclaimer. I know I don't typically do this, but we will be playing one of Tony Reed's videos and I don't think he's the kind of guy that would take offense to that. So you, I've had him on the channel to debate Nephilim free. Actually I've moderated him and Kent um, nice guy. Obviously he's wrong on the science, but he's at least respectful and cordial in debates. But I have to, I have to warn him. I have to warn the evolutionist that this isn't going to be good for him. Um, we are going to dismantle every single one of his arguments. In just one nine-minute video, he said more things wrong than words that were in that video. I know I say that frequently, but it's the, it's the fact. So um, it, br it brings me to mind this one right here. This one was funny. If you guys have ever, I'm going to screen share here. If you've seen this discussion I had a little while ago, going to go for its channel. Standing for truth. Two months ago, two months ago, I exposed these guys so bad, so bad. They had no arguments, no rebuttals. They slapped. I can't, if I had a dollar for every time they slapped and run that, that debate, I'd be a rich man. And I had that uploaded on my channel, but for a number of reasons, they gave me... Uh, they told me to remove it or else there'd be a copyright strike. So, you know, you've, you've lost the discussion so bad when you don't want your interlocutor to upload. It's been two months. I still apparently can't upload it. So anyways, yeah, that's you got to be careful with these atheists. When you refute them too bad, they um, they might want to silence you somehow. So why don't we and I'm not saying that's the case with uh, Tony Reid, but I've, I've experienced this myself uh, when the science is on our side. Praise I am that I am. Dell, Brother Daniel, says better to be safe than sorry. That's right. That's right. So good to, good to see everybody in the chat. So let's get started then. Let's start with a visual here. We've got CRISPR. This was actually from my Ron Garrett debate. Uh, hard to say it was a debate. And Ron Garrett's awesome. Got a lot of respect for him. But he really didn't come prepared for that debate at all. It kind of turned into a Young Earth Creation lecture for two hours, which is good. I'm sure that it planted some seeds and made the uh, evolutionists realize in the chat that even their PhDs don't have answers to our arguments. So CRISPR here might be tough to see, but it says, 
It is a mathematical certainty that is what the coalescence is. So in, in other words, he's trying to say that the data we see when it comes to the mitochondrial Eve, one single mitochondrial DNA ancestor, as well as the Y chromosome Noah in our case, Y chromosome Adam is, is the term that they've coined them. They'll say that that was a certainty. You know, they'd expect the same data when in fact, when in fact that is, it couldn't be further from the truth actually. And I've pointed it out numerous times that there is every single possibility. And actually Evo grad said this recently too, in the peaceful science blog. So I wanted to dismantle that before we get going. And in Tony Reed's video, he hints at that as well. So this is a commonly used argument. They did not predict it. Okay. Actually what, what you'll find when it comes to all the genetic data, Okay, they didn't predict any of it, but guess what? The Bible did. The Bible was written long before all of this data has come about. The, all this amazing genetics data is, is fairly novel. It, it's fairly new. It's a great time to be a young earth creationist. Great time to be a, a, a Christian. So evolutionary theory, it didn't predict any of the genetic, genetic data we're going to go over. They didn't predict a bottleneck. Okay. Um, they didn't predict that this population went through the Middle East and they did not predict a mitochondrial Eve or a Y chromosome atom. Um, Dr. Carter pointed out in the Evolution Dismantled movie, great film, I highly recommend it. He said, it was right near the ending, he said so beautifully, the evolutionary model is becoming more and more biblical. And isn't that, isn't that a fact? Um, Nicholas says Bible predictions. That's right. That's right, brother. The Bible predicted it thousands of years ago. This stuff didn't have to be true. And yet it is true. And that's what I kept saying to Todd the other day. Todd's another prime example of somebody who spends their entire time. I mean, he spent half his opening going over how he was a former young earth creationist and a former Christian. And he can go toe to toe with anybody on creation. He literally said those words, said he's been doing this for 20 years. He's got a degree in biology <laughs> and the poor guy, you know, and I got to admit, I mean, maybe I was a little hard on him, a little bit more uh, aggressive and adamant than usual, but hearing him, hearing these things come from him um, as if this is some kind of testimony that should worry us. I thought, you know, I'm going to show you the best evidence we have for young earth creation and, and biblical creation. And, and I'm going to predict that he's not going to be able to respond to any of it. And that's exactly what happened. His rebuttal, he ended up just choosing to, to utilize as a second opening. since <laughs> He couldn't uh, refute any of the openings. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Uh, but the fact is, when it comes to evolution, ape to man evolution, there is every single possibility that we would have found multiple diverse mitochondrial lines within modern people, within people today. And that some, and even all, of these would have been shared with chimpanzees, if we really are related to chimpanzees. They say the chimpanzees are our closest cousin. Um, and they brought in, of course, coalescence. They brought in post hoc, ad hoc explanations for the data. But according to our model, the biblical creation model that happened to fit the evidence perfectly. We didn't have to tweak anything. Uh, coalescence theory for anybody in the chat who's new to this. It's just a, it's a model. Okay. Of how gene variants sampled from a population could have originated from a common ancestor. Okay. Um, it, what we find with these mitochondrial lineages, the Y chromosome, for example, uh, the fact that the evolutionists would have had any every reason to expect multiple diverse mitochondrial lineages, it depends on historical demographics, okay? Now, if you do have a small enough population for a long enough time, what they'll say is all the mitochondrial lineages are expected to converge as lineages are lost due to drift, okay? Now, here's the issue. Here's the issue. For one, they didn't predict it, okay? And two, and two, the Bible predicted this thousands of years ago, but this whole coalescence theory, okay, as I, as I explained earlier briefly, it's proposing that given enough of these generations, 
you're going to trace back to just two common ancestors like we see. But here's the thing. This is their logic. This is what they say. This is their argument. I'm going to say it again. It's redundant, but it's important. They didn't predict this. Tony Reid likes to talk about predictions, predictions, predictions. Predictive power when it comes to the evolutionary model is very, very weak. They're not making any predictions right now. Nothing testable. They retrofit the data all the time, and I'm going to prove that. This coalescence theory, it has many assumptions, okay? But one of the assumptions actually being, and this is a problem, actually being that of random mating. I actually discussed this. Well, I, I utilized this against Todd the other day. That's when you have a population where all the people – have a strong likelihood of mating in marriage. But here's the problem. This isn't actually true historically, okay? Humans have existed in tribes that have been separated. There's no random mating. That's why the best rebuttals fail. You know, this was not a direct expectation. They can force fit it, of course. They can force fit it. But that doesn't mean it's empirical. A lot of the times it's post hoc, ad hoc. So uh, more on that later when we see the video. I'm going to play a clip, actually, from Dr. Carter from our interview where he, he, he makes a really good point on, on what I just said that I like and I want you guys to see. Um, I like how people are liking the clips and Godzilla Freak says, coalescence is evolution of the gaps. There's no independent evidence for it. It's just a rescue device. That's right. Rescue device after rescue device. Evolution storyboards is what I like to point out. Caleb, good to see you. Lena Powell, good to see you. Sal, good to see you as well, brother. Um, we're hoping to have Sal on soon. Hopefully, maybe in the next week, we're going to go, uh, we're going to discuss, have him give a lecture, a talk on protein improbabilities when it comes to the evolution of protein. So every time uh, Sal is on, I learn something new. Um, okay, guys. Yeah, I'm going to screen share here. Let me make sure that. Okay, so here's another reason why. And this is a really good point here. Here's another reason why it didn't necessarily have to be true. The data that we found. Okay, so as you can see here, a lot of clips that we're going to. So here's the video that we're going to be playing of Tony Reed. How creationism taught me real science, he calls it. Number 14, mitochondrial Eve. A lot of fun, a lot of fun. Poor Tony's not going to be coming back from it, though. So let's go to the clip of Dr. Carter. Here we go, guys. Skip past this intro, and let's go. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. They have an evolutionary creation model, which makes no sense. No, in creation, God can front load the genome with as much diversity as he wants to. If all variation is caused by mutation, absolutely, it's impossible. You can't get all the variation we see in modern people if we start from Adam and Eve, if they're 100% homozygous. Right. But what if God front-loaded Adam and Eve with like 20 million variants? Then we can lose half of them and still have as much as we have today. And 20 million is not a lot. I carry three or four million. You carry three or four million of the common ones and probably three or four million rare ones. That's fine. So it's actually trivial to start with Adam and Eve and get the people we have today as far as the number of variants especially if you had 6,000 years of mutation, you can have a lot of new variants appearing in that 6,000 years. Right. They're coming from their perspective of the evolution having to work in a short time period. Yeah. Well, so what are some of the best evidences for a literal Eve and a literal Adam? Well, the best evidences are the, the fact that we found Y chromosome Adam and mitochondrial Eve. Now the evolution has put them in a different place where I would put them, but it's quite clear. There's only one human Y chromosome. And all men share a very similar Y chromosome. That didn't have to be true. Because if we came from a common ancestral population with chimpanzees, that ancestral population would have had a diversity of Y chromosomes. And when the Right. If, if we actually came, if we ultimately share a common ancestor with the chimpanzee roughly 6 million years ago, but they're frequently changing the date due to... 
of course, the waiting time problem, fixating all those mutations in both lines. They'd have to fixate roughly 30 million DNA differences. So there would have been a lot of Y chromosome mitochondrial DNA diversity within that hypothetical population. Okay, so let's keep listening here. Population split into the lineages that led to humans and chimps. It's possible that we could have like in this ancestral population type A, B, C, and D. Well, if humans have type A and B, Godzilla Freak says, I love how this one Carter interview can be used to debunk just about every evolutionist. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Have you noticed how many uh, clips we get from this? Well, see, that was what was amazing about this interview is uh, Ra, Matt, and I, we've heard all the critics, critics' arguments. So we made sure to ask every single one of those arguments to Dr. Carter, and he just demolished them without even breaking a sweat. And they've had no response. There won't be any response. There'll be a lot of dodging. Team dodgeball, dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. So, yeah, <laughs> good point. Um, here we go. And chimpanzees had type B and C. That means there would be a human chimp who both had type B. They're more closely related to each other than the human is to another human on the Y chromosome. But it didn't work out that way. It's, you know, mathematically. It didn't work out that way, but it so coincidentally worked out exactly the way that the Bible predicted. Isn't that funny? To the evolutionists, it's a coincidence. And, and theoretically possible, but it's totally not true. There's only one Y chromosome. In fact, just yesterday, the um, or maybe the day before, they... Uh, one of Todd's arguments was... I mean, he was very mis he was very misinformed, but he's only been at this for 20 plus years, Todd. And he's only got a degree in biology and says he can go toe to toe with anybody on creation. So, you know, th th that's a good excuse. Give him another 20 years, uh, poor Todd, from the other night, and he'll maybe uh, be able to take on the best evidence for young Earth creation. But they'll, they'll say, you know, this was expected. This was expected. But as you can see here, no. No. What Now, if it would have been opposite of what we see it still would have been the same because they want to force fit the data right evolution is not really falsified they've they, falsifiable they've made it that way thank you george george bond says where's doki yeah that's true the the, the, the party doesn't start till doki walks in so hopefully doki walks in soon george good to see you thanks for being here let's continue here uh, but that's a fascinating point there that the that the evolutionists need to address they need to admit they didn't predict this data redid the neanderthal y chromosome which is really it's really weird that's what i was going to say todd he tried to make the claim that we don't have the neanderthal y chromosome and i just called him out right away i said that's just absolutely false absolutely wrong as dr carter is explaining here to me because for a long time we only had female ancient dna all the neanderthals all the the Denisovans, as they're sequencing them, they're all female. Like, well, why is no males? We got like 20 females and no males, something really weird. But they finally published a partial Neanderthal -like chromosome several years ago, and it was way different, way out in the left field. Like, oh, wow, I think it's really different. Well, just a couple of days ago, they replaced it with a very modern human one. Wow. And the common, the Y chromosome common ancestry to Neanderthals and, and humans, modern humans, is much more recent than it was last week. They totally redated it. Incredible. Wow. Where can we find that study? <laughs> I want that one. But uh, so, how about molecular clocks then? Um, do they support a literal Adam and Eve? And uh, can, an, uh, all right, is there a constant clock? Is there an See, here's, here's uh, something important, too, where they feel justified to assume, to assume the hypothetical split between chimps and humans because they often have to calibrate the data with their basic presupposition or assumption that humans and chimps split from a common ancestor. But you'll see that that assumption when they calibrate the data is not actually justified based on what we know about molecular clocks, the mutation rate, it being a little sporadic. Remember the mutation rate is fast. 
too fast for evolution. And there's not a lot of mutations that separate any person from the mitochondrial Eve consensus sequence. This is a huge problem for them. It's why they can't make predictions. It's why they have to calibrate the clock. It's why they have to calibrate the clock. So we'll keep going. An average clock that can actually be made? Yes and no. Okay. If you take a constant average for things we can measure in the laboratory today. You can get an approximation of how long ago uh, Y chromosome Adam or mitochondrial Eve lived. It's only a few thousand years. You don't need tens or even hundreds of thousands of years. Now, they don't like doing that. So they are like the Y chromosome right now, the clock is grounded in the time when Native Americans got to North America. In fact, the Y chromosome guys, they call that a sanity check that appears in several papers. So they're not using genetics. They're using archaeology to give them a clock so they can figure out how. As everybody knows here, we like, we like the empirical rate, the measurable mutation rate, not the assumption-based method like they do, right, where they assume the ape to human split, or they calibrate it with archaeology, as he's saying here, calibrate it with the deep time assumptions of the geological column. That's actually a circular way of doing things. Because what's the point in question? The deep time. So why would we assume the deep time? Why would we assume that which we are questioning? It's a lot of circular reasoning with the evolutionists. And the more you debate them, you realize just how fallacious their argumentations are. It's sad. It really is. How far long ago uh, mitochondrial e atom was, y, y chromosome atom was. Wow, that's interesting. But if you look at the measurable mutation rate from one generation to the next, it's a lot faster than they want it to be. But I don't like the molecular clock idea. I don't think it works. If you look at... Um, a Y chromosome family tree, and you look at people that are closely related, maybe in the same group, well, some of those people could have twice as many mutations as their cousin. Right. So what he's pointing out, I'll, I'll show it again later, but I showed it in my recent debate. The HVR haplogroup, the most common in Europe, I believe it is. You can see that there's more mutations in certain people of the same common ancestor. Okay. That's what he's explaining here. And you'll see, um, I'll, I'll show that visual later too or relative that came from a same, the same founder of that group. Mm. So like a uh, group R1B, I'm an R1B, 80% of Western uh, Europeans are R1B. If you look at the R1B founder and then you measure the branch lengths to all the individuals that are R1B, there are people twice as many mutations as, wait a minute, that means there's no clock. That means you can't put your finger on the tree and know how long it took for these many mutations to accumulate. And yet, if you just do a rough approximation, everything is young. There's another issue. On right. Too few mutations separating any person on this planet, even someone in Africa who would have the most diversity. Not a lot of mutations separating any person from the mitochondrial Eve consensus sequence. And mutation rates are incredibly fast. That's where we get the young date. It's actually where we get the young date for the Y chromosome ancestor and uh, being Noah, according to our model. But the evolutionists, Tony Reed, CRISPR, Evo Grad, Dr. Dan Dan, the pseudoscience man, they don't like the fast mutation rate because it conflicts with their deep time evolutionary story. They're not using the empirical method. They're using the assumption based, based method. That's why they love their fossil record. They love their deep time evolutionary Assumptions because the mutation rate in the DNA compartments known as the Y chromosome in uh, mitochondrial DNA is way too fast for their liking. Um, I wrote an article called Patriarchal Drive. I published it in the Journal of Creation. did some computer modeling. I said, we kind of know that the older a father is, the more mutations he passes on to his children. And I said... But if Noah was over 500 years old when he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and that population was reduced to six people, that means those three sons, their father was over 500 years old when they were born. 
that means they each got a huge dose of mutations. And as that post-flood population starts growing, these really old men are going to continue to have children. And the older they get, the more mutations their children are going to have. I call the patriarchal drive. And what it does is it totally messes up the average. It takes, you know, some kids being born in this population with 800 mutations and some kids are being born to a young father and they only have 10 mutations. So you can't look at the branch length on the tree and know that the branch length equals time. It does settle down after a while when now, you know, men today aren't having children when we're five, 600 years old. We tend to have children when we're 30 years old. That's a huge difference. Yeah. So there are problems with molecular clock, archaeologically, genetically, philosophically, mathematically. Yeah, we can still use it if we want to. Okay. So that's why when they want to assume the champ-human split, where they want to say, okay, it looks like we've been separated for this number of million of years, millions of years, of course that they assume, that they purport, by looking at the number of differences, say, that separate humans and chimpanzees, um, it's not justified. It's not justified based on the nature of mutations, the mutation rate, how fast it is, how sporadic it is. We'll get into a little bit more of that later. So um, I'm going to stay screen sharing here. We're going to go to... Okay, so before we get into good old Tony Reed's video... I want to, Tony Reed. Okay, so he left a comment. This is a while ago. They like to leave big comments. So I just read it over right now and I laugh because it's something that I've dealt with so many times. It shows that they're not up to date on the literature. So this is where I um, brought up the Y chromosome dissimilarity between humans and chimps. Okay. Um, and actually, to give you a breakdown of it, I'll go and screen share here. So I brought it up to Dr. Garrett. And he said he never heard of it. He never um, looked into it, never read the paper, which is fine. Can't know everything. But it is a strong indication, being that specific debate with Dr. Garrett on biblical creation, independent origins. This is a strong indication that independent origins is the case. Because the Y chromosomes between the chimpanzee and the human are highly, highly divergent. Okay? Um, so here's the paper here. And you can see quotes here. More than 30% of the chimp Y chromosome lacks an alignable counterpart on the human Y chromosome and vice versa. Whereas this is true for less than 2% of the remainder of the genome. Down here, Page's team found that the chimp Y chromosome has only two-thirds as many distinct genes or gene families as the human Y chromosome, and only 47% as many protein coding elements as humans. So right here, Y chromosome dissimilarity. And I asked this to... I'll show the clip. I asked this to Todd the other day, and it's kind of grown into a meme. His responses to all my questions were, I'm not going to fall for that trap. <laughs> and I couldn't help but think, Doki Doki actually had the best comment for the day. Doki Doki made the comment that, could you imagine Todd on, on a big important exam that he needs to pass? And for every single tough question that he didn't feel quite prepared for, he wrote in, I'm not falling for that trap. So <laughs> I'm going to show that clip actually from that debate. It was funny. So here, researchers were unprepared for what they would find when they recently completed sequencing of the chimpanzee Y chromosome and compared it to the human Y chromosome. The Y is full of surprises, said David Page of the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He and his team had just found that the Y chromosomes of chimps and humans are horrendously different from each other. Isn't that funny how you'll see here, uh, Tony Reed thinks this was predicted. <laughs> yeah, this was predicted just as much as the genetic data regarding the Y chromosome, mitochondrial DNA, the low genetic diversity. These things weren't predicted. Uh, let's see. Why did Dr. Page use the word horrendously? Because he believes in evolution. <clears throat> that chimps are our closest evolutionary relatives. But Page's team found that the chimp Y chromosome has only two thirds as many distinct genes or gene families as the human Y chromosome and only 47% as many protein coding elements as humans. Also more than 30% of the chimp Y chromosome lacks an alignable counterpart on the human Y chromosome and vice versa. We read that earlier. So, it's so this is what's funny is supposedly 
our closest cousin is the chimpanzee. But yet it turns out when considering overall architecture, gene content, size differences, our Y chromosome is more similar to that of the gorilla, which Gutta Gibbon still wants to deny it, it appears, because Gutta Gibbon wants to focus on that which is alignable and then ignore everything else. And they want to ignore everything else because they're assuming that, well, they have to be related. So why are the differences there? You know, they must, have, must be uh, rapid evolution, chromosomal rearrangements. We'll get into all that in a bit. So we'll continue. Upon seeing these and other stark differences, I'm going to check the chat and make sure everybody can see. Okay. Actually, before I continue. Okay, good. Um, super redeemed energy. Good to see you. Nicholas SWE with her sock account. <laughs> Is that actually uh no, there's no way. If so, I didn't even, I wasn't even able to put two and two together on that one. Okay, so upon seeing these and other stark differences between the respective Y chromosomes, Page now says the relationship between the human and chimp Y chromosomes has been blown to pieces. However, that doesn't mean that Page and his research colleagues doubt evolution, right? Because they don't question the bigger picture. They find this data. Like Dr. Garrett would say, right? He didn't have an answer. He admitted it, but just assumes there's going to be an answer out there. They don't question the bigger picture. They question the details and they force fit the data and they come up with their storyboard and rescue device. Um, so that's why they'll often say, well, that paper you're quoting, are they a young earth creationist? Of course not. <laughs> you know, They're going to come up with uh, some type of explanation, story, rescue device, but it's not empirical. It's post hoc, ad hoc. Um, Let's keep reading here. Indeed, the cleverly spin-laden announcement in Nature Journal heralded that rapid evolution distances chip Y chromosome from human equivalent. But Page's language tellingly invokes creator-like powers to explain the chimp slash human genomic origins. It looks like there's been a dramatic renovation or reinvention of the Y chromosomes in the chimpanzee and human lineages. It surely makes much more sense that the extraordinary divergence of the human, this is the conclude. This would be a valid conclusion here. Of the human and chimp Y chromosomes has nothing to do with supposed evolutionary ancestry, but everything to do with having been designed that way. Design explains not just Y chromosomes, but why there can be chromosomes. Chromosomes are highly complex. A single cell is more complex than the most well-engineered automobile on this planet. But they want to say that this all happened by chance for no reason at all. Well, you know what? You know what? This was exactly expected and predicted based on our model. It makes sense that the Y chromosome is this divergent from the human Y chromosome. We're not related. We're not related. It breaks that hierarchy when you got the gorilla Y and the human Y more similar overall, overall when we consider everything, than the chimp. But supposedly the chimp is our closest common ancestor, but uh, closest cousin, I'm sorry. We share a common ancestor with the chimp. Now, here's the thing. Now they need to force fit the data into their basic presuppositions, but nobody's taken the abiogenesis challenge yet. Nobody's debunked anything we've had. We had Dr. Ryan Hayes on, uh, we had Dr. Rob Stadler on to debunk Professor Dave. So they wanna make these assumptions with no real justification. And, th and that's, that's what the problem is. Um, okay, so I wanna go to back to the comment here. Okay, so. Tony Reed says, yeah, so I just love how, so it makes it look like, there we go. You know, the, the paper hasn't been analyzed by myself or a creationist. You know, I've been asking this question for, actually, I'm going to show you for months, maybe even a year. I asked it to Erica in our first debate. Um, and I'll show that clip in a second. Okay. No, Tony, he says, this is exactly what evolution did predict. No, they, this was a shock. They said, this is what they would expect. Actually, no, I've got the actual paper here. Nope, right here. I don't, okay. Here's the paper. Okay, let's see if I can find the part. So I'll show you the explanations in the paper that they give. Right here. This is right in the paper. They say 
that this is what they expected between chick chickens and humans as compared to it's right in this section let me see the consequence of gene loss by contrast Right here. Indeed, at 6 million years of separation, the difference in MSY gene content in chimpanzee and human is more comparable to the difference in autosomal gene content in chicken and human at 310 million years of separation. So then they go into their number of rescue devices here. Uh, hypotheses, no real empirical data. And Tony Reed's entire rebuttal, it's just, it's so sad. You can't make this stuff up. Is him just reiterating the conclusions of the paper. <laughs> like we've never read that, you know. Um, they never have an answer, so you never really have to go any deeper. And people like Todd, who had plenty of debates and videos to watch and prepare, could have had an answer, um, but didn't. So here, however, they did not predict and cannot account for the rapid divergence Notice this. However, they did not predict. According to uh, Tony Reed, this has all been predicted and expected. No. Retrofitted, maybe. Not predicted. I, I challenge him to show me where they predicted the genetic data or where they predicted the discoveries with their so-called out-of-Africa theory where they discovered other human variants outside of Africa like Neanderthalensis. Uh, show us where they predicted the hypothetical population bottleneck that reduced the, the population to between two and 10,000. Um, so, you know, they discuss here uh, some of the reasons. Some of the reasons can be due to, uh, one, the highly disproportionate role of MSY genes, especially Ampliconic gene families and sperm production, the brisk kinetics of ectopic recombination and resultant structural change in ampli ampliconic regions, and the absence of crossing over with a homologue. Um, they go into gene uh, gene conversion and the nature of chimpanzees, the way that they the way that they breed. Um, right here, the evolutionary impact of these three MSY features was likely multiplied by sperm competition, especially in the lineage of the modern chimpanzee, where multiple males mate with the same female at each. So, uh, oh, down here. So let's see. May account for greater MSY sequence amplification than in the human MSY and extensive gene loss compared with little or none in the human MSY. In the future, complete Y chromosome sequences from additional species will shed further light on these hypotheses. Okay, so here's, here's a major issue. Um, we do know that the Y chromosome is mutating a lot faster than, than has ever been expected. That's why we've been able to make testable predictions. So here, I'm going to go back up here. Boom. Boom. Evidence for a human Y chromosome molecular clock. Pedigree-based mutation rate suggests a 4,500-year history for human paternal inheritance when you look at high-sequencing chromosomal data. Okay, you find that the mutation rate is a lot faster than ever expected, ever predicted, which means, according to the mutation rate, in the context of the faster mutation rate, there's only a few mutations separating any person's Y chromosome from the what they would say is the Y chromosomal atom sequence. We would say Y chromosome NOAA. Here's the thing, though. Every single male Y chromosome on this planet is nearly identical. There's very little variation in Y chromosomes. You can take every single Y chromosome that's nearly identical and see for certain that we share one Y chromosomal ancestor in the not so distant past, but yet it's evolving rapidly. It's doing crazy things. You're not going to find any, any highly divergent or highly mutated Y chromosomes on the planet. For example, Dr. Carter pointed out, um, and I'll read, I've documented this in my Refuting Critics books. He, he says, it turns out that Y chromosomes are similar worldwide. According to the evolutionists, no ancient, in brackets, highly mutated or highly divergent Y chromosomes have been found. This serves as a bit of a puzzle to the evolutionists. 
And they have had to resort to calling for a higher reproductive variance among men than women. High rates of gene conversion in the Y chromosome or perhaps a selective sweep that wiped out the other male lines. For the biblical model, it is a beautiful correlation and we can take it as it is, right? Exactly what we expected, exactly what we predicted. We don't got to force fit, retrofit any of the data. And we're making testable predictions. Tony Reid always wants to say that evolution has scientific applications for it. That couldn't be further from the truth. Fail prediction after fail prediction. They can't meet the predictions creationists are making. Because of what we know about the Y chromosome data, we have confirmed predictions. Testing the predictions of the young earth Y chromosome molecular clock. No response to this one yet. Population growth curves confirm the recent origin of human Y chromosome differences. Here's the thing. This is the knockout punch. The only way to keep a rapidly evolving, a rapidly mutating Y chromosome, okay, that is also identical among all males in the human population is for it to be young. Because if we go back hundreds of thousands of years and ultimately millions and millions of years, if you go back to the Australopithecines up to, they typically say, Habilis, Arachnus, Arachnus existed for millions of years. You know, there's a lot of mutations that are floating around a population of probably a million or more strong with Arachnus. That's going to generate a lot of genetic diversity. Okay. Then they invoke the population bottleneck. They invoke selective sweeps. Okay. So even given hundreds of thousands of years, um, you'd expect some divergent, you'd expect some highly mutated Y chromosome populations in the world today, but you don't see that because the Y chromosome is young, but they can't question the bigger picture. So Tony Reed has to answer that without the storyboard. Cause what we're looking at here is storyboards from, uh, from Tony Reed. Um, see the chat here, Mitchell. Good to see you, brother. I appreciate that. Mitchell says, good night, Doki. <laughs> Mitchell, thanks for the super chats. I appreciate it. Um, Nicholas says a closer zoom would be nice. I'll, I'll try brother. I'll see. Um, okay. So let's see here. So th they won't, it's kind of like, it's kind of like genome degradation, right? If mutations are accumulating too fast and most of them are invisible to selection, selection can't remove them. Selection can only amplify the best mutations, get rid of the most detrimental and damaging mutations. That means the genome is young. There's shelf lives on genomes because they're degenerating, especially what we know about the function of the genome. But this isn't a genetic entropy um, uh, video yet. So I want to go to, so you got someone like Guts a Given that is so outdated on this. I want to play this quick clip. This is from, this is a secular lecture. This is an authoritative lecture here. Gorilla Y chromosome strongly conserved with human, but not chimpanzee. It, it, let me know in the chat. Is anybody familiar with how we expose Erica for saying that she, ex she knows that the human Y chromosome is most similar to the chimp still than the gorilla, regardless of how dissimilar it is. So we exposed her with that video and she came up with the worst, most ridiculous argument that, well, when you, when you don't look at the whole picture and you just look at the alignable regions or the regions that are similar, then it's still chimpanzee and human. Let's just ignore everything. <laughs> when it comes to overall architecture, overall, I've got a, let me see, there's paper after paper when it comes to this, but here's an article that hopefully you can see. It says, surprisingly, we found that in many ways, the gorilla Y chromosome is more similar to the human Y chromosome than either is to the chimpanzee Y chromosome. The chimpanzee Y chromosome appear. Now, remember, they never questioned the bigger picture. So the storyboard, there always has to be a storyboard, but no predictions, just hypotheses with no real empirical data. The chimpanzee Y chromosome appears to have undergone more changes in the number of genes and contains a different amount of repetitive elements compared to the human or gorilla. Moreover, a greater portion of the gorilla Y sequences, let's read this again, because Erica is coming out with a video tomorrow and she's going to try and fight this away. She's going to deny, deny, deny. The data speaks for itself. And that lecture, I guarantee she probably hasn't watched. Moreover, a greater portion of the gorilla Y sequences can be aligned to the human than to the chimpanzee Y chromosome. Isn't that funny? Look at this. 
basically, so here's the evolutionary assumptions. This is what evolution is. They can't read between the lines. They can't come to their own conclusion. They can't critically think. They lack critical thinking skills. And you can see that in Tony Reed's videos. Um, since we've sufficiently refuted people like Dan, Evo Grad, CRISPR, Erica, Aaron Raw, <laughs> now we'll go after Tony Reed. His arguments aren't as good, but he's got the videos out there that got a decent amount of views. We're going to take him on. Tony Reed's good for business. So it says basically, this means that while we are still more closely related to our chimpanzee cousins, assumption, of course. The Y chromosome has undergone such significant change. Do you really think the evolutionists would have seen this data and tap out and say, oh, looks like we were specially created. We have independent origins to the rest of the great apes. No, of course they're going to have an explanation. They're going to pull out the storyboard. And that's why Tony Reed's comment here is so pathetic. I'm going to go back to it. Just clearly demonstrating that he has no clue what's going on. No clue how to critically think. Where is it? I got so many clips here that we're going to be looking. So look at this. Oh, look at he says. All caught up. Now the actual paper in question, as if we haven't analyzed this. Uh, he's not going to be able to answer the problem. The, the only way to explain the fact that all Y chromosomes are incredibly similar. We have a recent Y chromosomal ancestor, but yet it's rapidly evolving and changing it's because it's young. But they don't question the bigger picture. So let's go back here. Um, so they'll say that their Y chromosome has undergone such significant change since humans and chimps split that human Y chromosomes now more closely resemble that of gorillas. No, how about we're not related to the chimps or the gorillas? <laughs> okay. You're not related to whales and pine trees. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. While this adds another aspect to the evolutionary relationship of the great apes. So here's the lecture. So just to anticipate, you know, Erica is going to try and fight this tooth and nail in her, in her next video, but the data speaks for itself. A five-year-old can read these articles and papers and see what's being said here. Okay. Overall architecture, overall gene ca content. When you consider the overall Y chromosome, the, the, the structure, the size differences, they're saying the human and gorilla is more similar than either are to the chimp. And actually, when you consider size differences with the chimp, the chimp and human is less than 35% dissimilar. Okay, so let's read this real quick. I actually commented on this. Okay, you're going to see this video. I commented on this, an authoritative lecture, secular lecture, on this exact issue. And I'm going to show you what the response was. Because it's contrary to what people like Guts of Gibbon want to admit. So here we go. Let's just listen to this little part about the dissimilarity. I'm going to show you the comment. I want to know about them as well. What I would like to uh, uh, really highlight is that after the <coughs> page sequenced uh, the, and, his, and his group sequenced the three primate Y chromosomes, something very interesting emerged. Is that human and chimpanzee Y chromosomes are very different from each other. Even though we're separated by only six million years. However, if you look at the gene content, um, the, two, um, the two Y chromosomes between chimpanzee and the human are as divergent from each other as the autosomes are between human and chicken. Well, there you go. It's, as, it's more divergent than the autosomes are from humans and chickens. <laughs> but let's pull out the storyboard. So separated by hundreds of millions of years. So what is really happening and why are they so different? And is this a, a general pattern? So you can listen to the whole lecture if you, I like looking at, I like watching their own lectures, reading their own literature. It's where you get the hidden gems. We went over their explanations for it and why it's a storyboard. So here's what I said. Let's see. And this was, I already knew what she was going to say. And this is to expose Guts of Gibbon on trying to explain away this data and denying the facts. Because evolutionists are the most biased people on the planet, okay? They can't get rid of their assumptions, their basic presuppositions. They can't question the bigger picture. They want so badly, so badly to believe that whales, banana plants, humans, 
and fish are all related through common ancestry and they all descend from a single cell like common ancestor with, with, with what ultimately came from non-living chemicals in a process they call abiogenesis that has chicken and egg problem after chicken and egg problem and it's all fairy tale guys evolutionists hope dream and imagine so here's here was the response and yes this is oddly true isn't that nice an honest response i said is it safe to say okay this is important guys because i know a lot of this might sound dry but this is the nature of these these critics arguments and they need to be dealt with sufficiently and in great detail so i say is it safe to say that at this point in time the human y chromosome now this is a simple question i couldn't have worded it any better okay the human Y chromosome is more similar to the Y, the gorilla Y chromosome than either are to the chimpanzee Y chromosome. Erica's trying to explain it away and say, no, this isn't the case and this and that and storyboard after storyboard. Yes, the response is, this is oddly true. This isn't a young earth creationist evolutionist. Though this video is now 20 years old and more sequencing has been done, on, on other primates, it does appear, it does appear that both chimpanzees and the closely related bonobo are the most dissimilar in comparison to humans. Isn't that funny? Yet our closest cousin is the chimpanzee and the bonobo versus the gorilla, of course. Yet the why, look at this. Yet the Y is the most dissimilar out of all other primate species. On top of that, it gets worse. The chimpanzee MSY harbors twice, twice as many massive palindromes as the human MSY. Not to mention that most of the MSY protein coding genes and gene families are not present in chimps that are in humans. <laughs> from an evolutionist themselves. You don't need, oftentimes you don't even need to read a creationist article to debunk them. They debunk themselves. Um, read that part again. The chimpanzee MSY harbors twice as many massive palindromes as the human MSY. Not to mention that most of the MSY protein coding genes and gene families are not present in humans that are in chimps that are in humans. This is fascinating stuff. I asked this question. I'm not, you know, out, out Syed. Watch this. This is too funny. This is too funny. I ask him. I ask him this question. <laughs> the debate. Look at the debate. Independent origins. His response? I'm not falling for that trap. Could you imagine a creationist said that in a debate? We'd never live it down. Here, I'm going to play this real quick. Then run upstairs and refill my water. My mouth's getting dry. Here we go. Similarities in the early stages of manufacturing and, and blueprints. But it's the final product that you see the biggest differences. I pointed to a number of lines of evidence other than uh, these lines of evidence that are agnostic, like orphan genes, for example. Um, what you said about the non-coding DNA. ENCODE has revealed that over 80% of the genome is actively transcribed in RNA. And these non-protein coding RNAs, I talk about this frequently, they regulate virtually all aspects of the gene expression pathway, okay? Evolution has never predicted this much function. Now, if most of that activity is just uh, useless activity or spurious, for example, it wouldn't make any sense for the cell to replicate all of that useless information. All of those uh, DNA sequences are mutated to... Oblivion. We know introns are not just passive spacers. They are rich in splicing factor recognition sites. So, you know, what we'll do to not bring up too many topics, I feel like I've addressed everything you said. So I'm going to just narrow it in. I got one minute here. I'll ask a simple question and then we can kind of go back and forth on it. So if I go here, my question would be, if we really are related to the chimpanzee, okay, this paper is actually from, I think, 2007. So there's no excuse to never have seen it. Chimpanzee and human Y chromosomes, when you consider uh, structure, gene content, uh, overall architecture, less than 35% similar. But yet they are supposed to be our, our closest cousins. So how can you explain that massive, massive dissimilarity? This is a secular paper, Todd. So just focus on this one question. I answered your question on embryological development, chromosome fusion. Now answer one of my questions. How do you explain the massive dissimilarity between human and 
and chimpanzee Y chromosome, and then we'll, we'll run with this. And then you can't accuse uh, me of gish galloping. So uh, you can either address a few things in the three minutes or directly answer this. this right. oh, praise, I am screen sharing for you. His entire rebuttal was hilarious. He said I gish galloped. When I spent half of my opening explaining the mitochondrial DNA phylogenetic tree and going over how mutation rates confirm independent origins. If he would have just had even one little rebuttal to that, he would have given a rebuttal to half of my opening presentation. He just said, oh, you gish galloped and then didn't rebut anything. You see these guys? This is a guy who said that he... He literally said that he used to travel hours to go see Ken Hovind seminars 20 years ago. He was a huge fan, he said. He said, I've been at this for 20 years. I've got a degree in biology. I can go toe to toe with anybody on creation, even though I'm not a creationist, he says. And then he had no rebuttal to any of our best data. He had arguments from the 80s. He used vestigial organs. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? I told him that I felt like he stepped in a time machine from 30 years ago. And then walked out of the time machine in 2020 and came into this debate. <laughs> That's what it felt like. So here we go. The guy supposedly is a creation expert, former creationist. Here's a paper that's been out since what, 2005, 2007. Instead of answering, he uses his famous line that he uses all throughout the debate. I'm not falling for that trap, he says. For him to help him out, though. Did you make sure to screen share? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Todd. If you want to answer that question, go ahead. All right. Well, if I get three minutes here, first of all, I'll say that, uh, th again, this is a topic that I'm not super familiar with. Again. again. Eventually, I, I ask him, this, and it sounds like I'm being harsh to the guy. But remember, this is a guy who was in other streams bragging about how he's a former young earth creationist and we believe in pseudoscience and this and that and ad hominem after ad hominem. These are the kind of guys you got to expose. You got to expose these guys. So here we go. He, he admitted, again, I don't know. What a real good, he must have been a lousy young earth creation apologist, put it that way. I debated a guy two years ago, Wayne Fillmore, who's a supposed former young earth creationist. And I brought up genetic entropy to him. And he didn't know what genetic entropy was. Face palm. You're a former young earth creationist, but you don't even know what genetic entropy is. You don't even know who Dr. John Sanford is. And you're a former young earth creationist. See, these so-called former young earth creationists, they don't know anything about young earth creation. It's somebody who went to one boxing class, didn't like it, got their butt kicked. 20 years later, they're telling people they're a former boxer. You're not a former boxer. You went to one class and got your butt kicked. You're not a former young earth creationist. You don't even know the basics of young earth creation. <laughs> so, here we go, here we go, let's hear them. So, no excuse to see a paper from 2007. I'm not a geneticist. Would I have access to all these and read these all unless this is a topic I'm specifically focusing? I'm not falling for that trap. The simple matter of the fact is... He's not falling for that trap. He's not falling for that trap. So uh, <laughs> you can't make that, this stuff up. Yeah. Um, Brother Sal pointed out this. Yeah. Brother Sal, this is a great lecture. Um, I love that I got a response real quick. And the response was a simple yes, because um, it's just the fact, evolutionists. Get over it. Accept the data and go to your storyboards proudly. Proudly, I tell you. Here, you know, Dr. Garrett thought I snuck up on him when I asked him the Y chromosome. Um, when I asked him the Y chromosome question. This is my first debate with Erica a year ago. I'm asking her the same question. <laughs> Don't these evolutionists prepare for debates? When I agree to a debate, you know, if it's in a week from now, I prepare. I watch their debates. I check what their arguments are. I prepare possible rebuttals. These guys got no excuse for not being ready for these same questions that are constantly asked. We're just looking for answers. Here we go. A year ago, I asked Erica and this didn't go well for Erica either. And she's supposedly their best. And it's been a year and still no answer. She said, finally, I'm going to give you an answer. You know, a video is coming out in a couple days. That uh, So here we go. Here we go. This is a good part. I think we might be both guilty regarding yeah. that. So I'm not saying that it's only an extrapolation fa fallacy that we can look at similarities in our genetics. Like I said earlier, every single human being on this planet is 99.9% .9 similar, which says we have low genetic diversity, indicating we came from a small planet. Lena Powell says, that guy has a biology degree. God help us. I agree. It's sad. Th these evolutionists, they're grasping at straws. 
Godzilla Freak says, by this logic, I'm a former evolutionist because my middle school teacher talked about it for a week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. These former Young Earth creationists that go on Dapper Dino's channel, for example, if I was on there, ask them one Young Earth creation prediction. They won't even be able to tell you one. Okay, so here we go. Here we go. Small population. Okay, this is a good thing for us. Now, you want to extrapolate that to mean we also have similarity. Notice this was a year ago, and Erica's still trying to say that I never answered the question about why should we not categorize humans as apes? You know, and I'm admitting even here that when it comes to homology, when it comes to nested hierarchical patterns, when we're classifying animals and creatures according to anatomy, morphology, physiology, and genetics, yes, humans are more similar to the chimpanzees and to the great apes than they are to a fish or a bacteria. Okay, this is just basic. This is just basic. When you want to think of the human vessel, okay, we're made up of DNA, RNA, proteins, carbohydrates, blood, muscles, ligaments, <clears throat> tissues, then the fact that we would share the most with mammals, we're considered a mammal, you know, we're considered a vertebrate, and they want to call us apes. Well, if they want to just look at the vessel and not like that which is spiritual, then in a sense, them being an evolutionist, they will label us humans as an ape in the same way that they would label us as a mammal or a vertebrate. But that does not mean that humans are actually related to a chimpanzee, a gorilla, and everything we're discussing here when it comes to the Y chromosome, when it comes to the mitochondrial DNA, the Y chromosome, this all suggests independent origins, okay? Linnaeus was actually a creationist. Taxonomy is all just classifying things. A lot of it's arbitrary, okay? You can classify anything, but he based his classification system Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species off of function. And that's why we look to function. And it's just funny that, you know, I'm sure in her video in the next couple of days too, she'll say the, the question still hasn't been answered. It's like, I don't know what to tell you. We share the most with the great apes. It's true. By definition, when God created life in humans and biblical kinds, obviously we would have been more similar to some creatures and less similar to others. Do you think that we would just be equally distant from the great apes and a fish and a bacteria? No, of course we're going to be more similar to the great apes than we are to the fish and then we are to the bacteria. There is a natural groups within groups patterns that we see, but it's expected on both sides. With chimpanzees, for example, and we also have similarities with monkeys. We have similarities with dogs, whales, fish, all the way down the line to a bacteria, the nested hierarchy of life. I'm saying we too predict nested hierarchies. Therefore, it's difficult to draw that line since we both predict the exact same thing. We need something that's going to differentiate between the two lines of evidence that both models can explain. That's why I pointed to something because you talk about similarities. So earlier in the debate, I pointed to the Y chromosome. Um, she kind of dodged it. I will say I really enjoyed my debates with Erica. Cordial, respectful enjoyable, engaging, you know, I prefer an engaging debate rather than a debate with somebody like Todd the other day where they don't even engage the data. They don't even attempt. Every time you ask them a question, they say, I'm not falling for that trap, you know? So these debates were good. I recommend them. Um, but I do believe she did not answer the important questions. Debate number two, we discussed orphan genes right off the bat when it comes to independent origins. And, you know, I don't know is typically the answer, which is fine. But by debate standards, by definition, when you're debating that topic, and there's a very, very powerful line of evidence that can differentiate between the two models. If they don't have an answer for that powerful differentiating evidence, by definition, they did not meet their burden for the debate. This is a fact. So here, let's continue. The Y chromosome, for example, and this time I'll, I'll hopefully you, um, you know, you can answer it. But the thing is, the low level of recombination and sequence diversity on the Y chromosome that I'm talking. About. Oh, thanks, Nicholas. I'll try and uh, I'll try and make it louder, brother. Actually, it looks like it's on full, full blast. Okay, let's see if that's a little better. Talking about should make should make the Y chromosome the most similar 
between humans and chimps. But the problem is that the human and chimp Y chromosomes are actually incredibly... What you're going to see is another example of a so-called former young earth creationist who wasn't even aware of this powerful line of evidence for our position. This, this is the nature of these so-called former young earth creationists. They're not former young earth creationists, okay? It's all psychological. It doesn't work on us, though. Dissimilar. When they should be the most stable because they are immune, for the most part, to recombination. So how do you explain the fact that the Y chromosome is less than, than 70% similar between chimps and, and humans? Well, first of all, I would, I would, as I continue to kind of begrudgingly admit throughout the course of this conversation that genetics really isn't kind of my field. Um, <clears throat> the thing about Erica, though, is if you've seen her debates with like G-Man or even her first debate with Kent Hovind, her main argument was a genetics-based argument. But then, and this isn't to sound mean if Erica's listening at some point, but the fact is, then when you're when Erica's cornered by a genetics-based argument, then suddenly genetics isn't my specialty, and which is fine, we can't all specialize in everything, but she's using primarily a genetics-based argument against Ken Hoven. She was using it, uh, she attempted it against me. So it's kind of like they pick and choose, right? Uh, but it, there's also a double standard because when a creationist in a debate says, I don't know on something, suddenly the evolutionists in the chat or in the comment section declare that creationist as the loser of the debate. But then they don't treat the evolutionists the same way. They typically say things like, oh, isn't that sweet? They admitted they didn't know how honest, you know, so here we go. But this is a very powerful line of evidence. You'd think these, these militant evolutionists, these uh, hardcore critics of young earth creation, why aren't they up to date on this stuff? So we'll continue to see the, the lack of answer is what it was. Um, I can talk to you a lot about, you know, other stuff, but genetics isn't it. So I'm not, I'm not kind of adept enough to really answer your question in a way that I feel that, that you would find sufficient. I don't know. Um, I would ask you out of curiosity if by chance that 70% number comes from Tompkins. I got to point this out. She thought that this 70% number comes from, do, do you see how biased they are? They She automatically wants to pin it on Dr. Tompkins and try and complain about his methodology. I'm still screen sharing, right? Let's go back to that paper. Right here. Nope. Right here. Not Tompkins. Chimpanzee and human Y chromosomes are remarkably divergent in structure and gene content. January 2010. Okay, well-known paper. They were surprised by the data. It's not a creationist paper. They always just want to pin the argument. Well, was this talk? They want to try and discredit the argument, right? Um, I haven't watched this debate in a while. I hope I shut her down good on this one, but let's see. Let's go back to it. Um... Here we go. No, no. I've asked a good question. I have the paper where it came from. Do you know who the author is? Of course, because they were shocked by it. But from my understanding, talking to scientists where I debated Dr. Stephen Fellow, for example, their explanation would be gene conversion because it can exchange um, genetic material within itself, right? It's like rec recombination is like shuffling a deck of cards, but the Y chromosome doesn't have a counterpart to do that too. Therefore, therefore, they should be the most stable. It's the best chromosome to look at. My question would be to the evolutionist, <laughs> Dr. Stephen Feller, whoever, uh, Herman Mays that wants to look to that as a rescue device, what testable prediction can you make and bring forth regarding change we're on, on gene conversion in the Y chromosome because yeah, and it's okay that, that you don't have the answer to it, but that would be a, a differentiating line of evidence that can tell us are chimps and humans actually related. There's no way they can be based on the dissimilarity. Of anyway, so the, the point is this was this 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 was a fatal blow to Erica in this debate. As a matter of fact, this is just a fatal blow to evolutionary theory. Okay, but the point of this is, listen, this data has been around. You have no, people don't have, these evolutionists don't have an excuse for not knowing this, this stuff, not having an answer. Um, so we're going to check out, I don't want Tony Reed accusing that we didn't debunk his comment. Check his comment. It's sad. Um, 
it's it, it all it just proves that he's out of touch out of touch with what out of touch with reality um so here's a good article actually one one fatal blow and then we're just going to smash through his video too we've addressed a lot of his video actually already but here's Here's a great article actually on creation.com. Now, before the evolutionists accuse us of now looking at an article on creation.com, well, we've looked at the actual paper itself. We've looked at secular articles. We've looked at a lecture. Um, a, a lecture I would recommend to everybody right here. Katerina Makova. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Brother Sal seems to be aware of her. So um, I'm not entirely sure if she's the one that replied here. But it, it is an authoritative lecture. And, um, you know, here's the thing. The response probably didn't assume that I was a young earth creationist. The, the, then they'll e easily admit to. And, and I love how that she says this is oddly true. But then when you get these, these uh, critics on YouTube that dedicate their lives to debunking creation, they're so biased. They won't admit to any problem. They won't admit to any issues. Okay, so let's see. Uh, ch -ch -ch. Let's see where we would read here. So Dr. Carter talks about how, according to many evolutions, the Y chromosome, the DNA sequence that makes men what they are, is supposed to be, yeah, so this is what they say. This is actually what, uh, hopefully people can see, I'll see in the chat. This is what Speed of Sound was trying to say with his rescue device. Uh, Mitchell says, anyone that says they were a young earth creation and now an old earth creation is just deceiving themselves. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You can talk to them for uh, a couple minutes and you'll realize that they know very little. Brother Nicholas says, standing, oh no, um, to be fair, Nicholas says, to be fair to Todd, maybe 20 years ago he was a young earth creationist, but young earth creationists come light years since then. You're right. You're right, Nicholas. So these evolutionists, if they want to continue the battle, they better update themselves with the best arguments. You want to understand your opponent's best arguments, okay? That's why I typically like to go for the jugular. I like to attack their so-called best lines of evidence, nested hierarchies, pseudogenes, ERVs, retrotransposons, so-called chromosome 2 fusion, all of these things. You know, their so-called best lines of evidence have actually turned out to be evidence for our position. Okay, so he says, it is a small and slightly twisted, when it's in its condensed form, much of it is made of repetitive element. It contains relatively few protein coding genes. And since the corresponding X chromosome is so large, the Y chromosome was thought to not do very much. They, they always assume these things, right? Like the junk DNA paradigm. Um the vestigial organs and structures, for example. So he points out, um, let's see. It turns out the trend was wrong. From the findings of modern genetics, don't you just love modern genetics? How beautifully modern genetics uh, confirms our model. We have learned that the Y chromosome is a master control switch affecting genetic expression of thousands of genes on all the other chromosomes. It all evolved by chance for no reason at all, according to the evolutionists. Take the abiogenesis challenge, guys. Its effects are so profound that it makes the difference between men and women. The Y chromosome is also very important for studies of heredity and evolution due to its mode of strict paternal inheritance. See, we love the uniparentally inherited DNA, like the Y chromosome, the mitochondrial DNA. It confirms our model. We love it. Using Y chromosome sequence data. One can build a family tree of Y chromosomes and use it to chart historical migration patterns of people across the world. Early work discovered that all human males have very similar Y chromosomes. This led to the con conclusion that there was a single male ancestor for the entire world population. They called them Y chromosome Adam. So here's the new study. Um, the new study surprised many on the, on the chimpanzee. Okay, I want to go down to here, show, uh, I want to show where Tony Reed really goes wrong and where he can't. So all of this, everything Car Dr. Carter's saying, everything we're well aware of, if the evolutionists ever gave an actual argument, we could get into the, into the nitty gritty. 
Okay, this is this is the paper going over the paper. Tony Reed thinks he's got an argument because he's re reiterating the conclusion of the paper, the hypotheses of the paper. I mean, <laughs> say it all the time. You can't make this stuff up with the evolutionists. What are the differences? There are two main classes of MSY sequences shared between the two species, ampliconic and X-degenerate. Humans also have X-transposed sequences, but the chimp does not. The X-degenerate regions of chimp and man differ by a full 10%. This is huge considering the 99% identical claim that we have heard parroted so often over the previous several decades. But this is only the beginning of the differences. To compare the ampliconic regions, they had to appeal to extensive rearrangement. Notice, they had to, because they're not going to question the basic uh, paradigm and rampant sequence gain and loss. Half of the chimpanzee ampliconic sequence and 30% of the entire MSY has no counterpart in the human Y chromosome, in, in the human MSY and vice versa. These are sizable differences. Talks about how this was a shock. Once again, this amount of differences was expected between the autosomes of humans and something like a chicken. Chicken isn't even a mammal. <laughs> Finding this much difference in one of the sex chromosomes was huge. Guys, this, this is great evidence. And this is why they're scrambling for, um, for an answer. Okay, so then he, then he goes over, just like the paper, to account for their data, they proposed several factors. We went over that earlier from the paper itself that led to the differences between chimp and man, including sperm competition. Erica likes to point this one out. Like it's just, it's a game changer. It's a revelation. We've never heard of it. Genetic hitchhiking. We saw that in the paper. And rates, high rates of gene conversion, right? We talked about that. That's what I pointed out a year ago, almost, to the Erica debate. I gave her her answer <laughs> and then asked her to make predictions, which she couldn't. Here we go. This is what I said earlier in a nutshell. The idea that the Y chromosome is evolving at a high rate is based on the assumption of common ancestry. But there is an extremely low level of variation between human Y chromosomes, which would not be expected if they were mutating at a high rate. Now, here's the thing. That's what's funny, is that the fact that there's such low variation, okay? So, so such low variation, but yet it, it's mutating faster, right? It, it's in line with our data, 4,500 years worth of mutations. That means it's young or else there would be, it would be a lot more divergent, more highly mutated Y chromosomes. First, for the evolutionists, the Y chromosomes must be evolving much more quickly than anyone imagined. They are now going to have to apply mathematical models to try to demonstrate how a sequence can change extremely rapidly, including wholesale rearrangement. Isn't it so funny? Instead of concluding the, the obvious, you know, they're all in their lab. It's their job, right? They're on the, they're back to the drawing board, doing what they can, pulling out the storyboard, <laughs> going left, right, up, down to try and explain the data. Wholesale rearrangement of significant parts and the evolution of entire gene families in a relatively short amount of time, yet stay homogeneous within a species. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? All of this, and yet still so homogeneous in the human population. This is going to be very difficult for them. It is. This is why they don't have an answer. They fail every time. Tony Reed's best attempt was a fail. Tony Reed, he needs to retire or convert. We'd welcome you into the family, Tony. Second, for the creationists, we now know that the old humans and chimps are 99% identical. Canard is pass. Interestingly, a significant paper appeared in 2007 calling the 99% rule a myth and claiming that we have known for decades that humans and chimps were much more different. But this has been a significant and powerful evolutionary argument. How many people had their faith wrecked on those mythical rocks? Now we have half of the chimpanzee Y chromosome and learn that it is only 70% identical. But remember, remember, when you consider overall size differences and overall architecture, it's less than 35%. 35%. It's sad. So that was long-winded to go over that one, but that one needed to be addressed. So what I want to do is now go through Tony Reed's video and have some fun. So we will, um, 
Let's see. So, Guts of Gibbons in the chat. Good to see you. She says, hey there, Mitchell. Hope you're well. Trying to stick around to make sure. Standing for truth sees the above, but it is too late where I am. Um, I'm not sure how much you watched Guts of Gibbon, but good to see you. I hope you are well as well. You're kind of famous around here. So if anybody wants an autograph from Gigi, she's in the chat. Not sure if she, um, I would recommend Guts of Gibbon watch this, this lecture. Gutsick, Gorilla Y chromosome strongly conserved with human, but not chimpanzee. Uh, Erica, I'd definitely watch that. Um, and take a look at this great lecture um, where I point out, is it safe to say that at this point in time, the human Y chromosome is more similar to the gorilla Y chromosome? An authoritative lecture and a great response, great response, an unbiased response, somebody just admitting the problems to their evolutionary philosophy. The answer is yes, this is oddly true. Not to mention that most of the MSY protein coding genes and gene families are not present in chimps that are in humans. Isn't that funny? So it's it's a real shame that the evolutionists they have, they're, they're, they're in a corner because they want to say that it's rapidly evolving. But then every single male Y chromosome is nearly identical, extremely low variation, only 4,500 years worth of mutations found in the Y chromosome. Okay. You can't have it both ways. This indicates youthfulness. This indicates a young Y chromosome, if it really is doing this many crazy things. But we just spent an hour and a half on that. So... Uh, good to see you, Erica. If you just got in here, you might just want to go back to the beginning. Uh, we left no stone unturned. So let's see what videos we played. So we played the video from good old Todd. We played the clip from Erica, the debate on the Y chromosome. And now we are going to, we played some Carter videos, read some papers, read some articles. And we're having fun. So let's get right into our good friend, Tony Reed. Evolutionists have stumbled upon one of the first testable conclusions made by creationism. The genome of all human beings can be traced back to a single woman that scientists call mitochondrial Eve. Within the cells of nearly all eukaryotic life are small organelles known as mitochondria. Mitochondria are known as the powerhouses of the cell because their primary function appears to be the production of the cell's main energy source, adenosine triphosphate, also known as ATP. The mitochondrion has its own DNA separate from the nucleus and divides via binary fission within the cell. Because they reproduce asexually, they are not subject to the recombination of genes that occurs with nuclear DNA during sexual reproduction. The part of the sperm cell which requires energy is the tail, so that's where the majority of the mitochondria are located. Typically at fertilization, the tail breaks off, so very few male mitochondria end up in the egg. The egg cell contains enzymes which break down the sperm cell to release its nuclear DNA. These enzymes see the male mitochondria as foreign bodies and break them down as well. Because of all of this, in humans, mitochondria is passed on virtually 100% of the time from the mother. There is only one known case of a human being in... Exactly right. So this, as I pointed out many times, pointed it out earlier in the video. This is why, this is precisely why we like the uniparentally inherited DNA, the non-recombining DNA essentially. It's a more straightforward approach to mutation rates with very little assumptions. Now, we've already gone over in detail, and I challenge the evolutionists to refute our discussion with Dr. Carter. We, we went over earlier at the beginning a uh, number of reasons why they can't really assume that split, that hypothetical split when doing um, molecular clock data, calibrating the clock with uh, archaeology, with the deep time, deep time based assumptions. We just like to, to compare mutation rates in the present. Okay. It would be circular to assume evolution. Okay. The deep time is what's in question. We like to use parents to offspring. We've heard it many times before. I'll say it again. It's the pedigree based method. 
Okay. Now, when comparing mutation rates between parents and children, we know that the mutation rate is much faster than the phylogenetic rate, which assumes ape to man evolution. It's actually kind of, it's actually quite, quite simple. We can just look at a family. So we'll take a family. Okay. Now we count up the differences between the people. And doing this, we can get a pretty accurate mutation rate. And that rate is far too fast for, for evolutionists. They want to look at all the differences between humans and chimpanzees and say, okay, we've been separated for 6 million years, 8 million years, 10 million years. It's becoming difficult for them because the more they push it back, eventually they're going to have to say that um, apes <laughs> lived with dinosaurs. And they're not willing to do that, but there is a waiting time problem. That's why it's constantly changing. So then we count up the differences between people today, trace that back to past ancestors, and we're going to see a much faster mutation rate than, than evolutionists would want. We love the empirical rate. I'll go over the phylogenetic tree again in a bit too, to show you that even when considering substitution rates, even when considering purifying selection. There's not a lot of mutations that are separating any person, including a person in Africa, which would have the highest diversity from the mitochondrial uh, Eve consensus sequence. So um, I've been asking that question over and over again uh, through the phylogenetic tree, through the visual, and they have no answers to it. So let's continue here inheriting their mitochondrial DNA from their father. It was reported on August 22nd of 2002 in the New England Journal of Medicine. The patient was a 28-year-old man with severe, lifelong exercise intolerance. He had never been able to run more than a few steps. After examining samples of blood, hair, and other tissues, it was discovered that the young man had inherited his father's mitochondria and, even though they had survived fertilization, the mitochondrial DNA had been damaged in the process, which interrupted the ability for his mitochondria to produce adequate energy for muscle exertion. You know, I, I don't think, um, Erica, I don't know if it's going in one ear and out the other, but I'll say it again. When it comes to the Y chromosome, there's incredibly little variation. Every single male Y chromosome is nearly identical. But the evolutionists want to say that the Y chromosome is so rapidly changing. Okay. That can only be true. And we agree that it is mutating a lot faster than ever expected. That's why we're now able to make testable predictions on uh, the history of civilization using the Y chromosome. Because there's only about 4,500 years worth of mutations in the Y chromosome. There's only a few. Once again, just like the mitochondrial DNA, there's really only roughly a few mutations in the Y chromosome. Okay, in any person on the planet separating them from the Y chromosomal atom consensus sequence. Okay, according to our model, of course, that would be Y chromosome Noah. It's not very stable according to how quickly it's mutating. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that speaks of the youthfulness of the Y chromosome because you can't go back hundreds of thousands of years. That's why they can't point to a highly divergent. They can't point to any ancient Y chromosomes on the planet. This is the evolutionists themselves are the ones that have called for a higher reproductive variance among uh, men than women, high rates of gene conversion. Um, they've invoked selective sweeps, but it doesn't matter what they invoke. It's storyboard. Okay. All we're going to get on Wednesday is more storyboards because guess what? We're the ones that predicted the data. We're the ones, according to the Bible, which was written thousands of years ago, this is what needed to be true. Okay. And we went over why coalescence is a major problem based on what they assume, based on the random mating that they assume, and based on the fact that there was every reason to expect multiple diverse mitochondrial lines. And the same goes for the Y chromosome. So they can have any storyboard they want, but it wasn't predicted. It wasn't predicted. They've retrofitted the data. And the fact is, when you consider overall architecture, gene content, when you look at the Y chromosomes as a whole, do I got to go back to this lecture over here, where it's confirmed the human Y is more similar to the gorilla Y than the chimp Y. So, um, you know, these questions need to be answered, hopefully, on Wednesday. Uh, because we're not interested in the storyboard, explaining it, retrofitting it, okay? Um, we've gone over the paper. We've gone over articles 
discussing the paper, critiquing the paper. We understand the evolutionists aren't going to tap out and say, oh, turns out independent origins is true. Oops, we're not related. No, they're going to have their answers. We went over their answers. We're not hiding their answers. We're not scared of the answers, but it was never predicted. And if what they're saying is true, there's a few observations we should be seeing today in humans, in human populations that we don't see. So it means the Y chromosome's young. Devoid of modern society's conveniences, this condition would render the patient unlikely to reproduce. So scientists can confidently trace all humans back through their matrilineal line to one single woman, just like creationism and evolution both predict. But this is where the common predictions between the two theories end. The out of Africa scenario for human origins predicts that this common ancestor would have lived somewhere in Africa. At first, one would assume that creationism's prediction is that mitochondrial Eve would have lived near the Tigris and Euphrates, as the book of Genesis clearly describes the Garden of Eden being located in that vicinity. The problem. I have a. F well, he might. I'm not sure if Tony Reid is even going to explain why. Why they've placed their eve where she is but we're, we're going to go over that in a bit we're, we're going to leave no stone unturned as always the problem with this prediction is that it is based on a misunderstanding of what mitochondrial eve actually is mitochondrial eve is not proposed to be the first woman nor was she the only woman living at the time she is proposed to be the most recent common female ancestor if we were to actually identify the individual theorized to be mitochondrial eve as populations change over time that woman's identity would also change change. To give a greatly exaggerated example of this, if the population of the Earth were to be wiped out except for you and a cousin who is the child of your mom's sister, there would be a radically new mitochondrial Eve. Her identity would be your grandmother on your mother's side. She would be the most recent common ancestor between the two of you, the entirety of the human race. Even according to a strict biblical reading, the chances are that mitochondrial Eve would not be Eve but one of her descendants. More accurately, the most recent common female ancestor would have been someone who lived either just before or just after the biblical flood when the population had been reduced to only eight individuals. Perhaps she could have even been Noah's wife herself. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't actually reveal where Noah lived before the flood, but we can reasonably say that if creationism were accurate, mitochondrial Eve would have lived somewhere in or near the Persian Gulf, being reasonably near the Tigris and Euphrates while also being close to the mountains of Ararat. In April of 1970. Okay, so let, let, let's let's stop it there for a bit. So let's Let's go back to <clears throat> okay so let's go to this so as we know mitochondrial dna mutates fast there's not a lot of mutations even here how old is humanity mitochondrial dna was found to mutate about 20 times faster than previously thought at a rate of one mutation every 33 generations approximate substitution that is approximately in this section of the control region which has about 610 base pairs humans typically differ from one another by 18 mutations so let's get an actual visual here now we know that there's been pedigree based studies not all of them but some that actually land very very close to the 6500 year date we've discussed many times the eve mitochondrial consensus sequence we know eve but let's go here okay this is from the Thousand Genomes Project as a program, as we know. It's human mitochondrial DNA found in the world today. You'll notice right off the bat, right off, because he wants to say that, you know, this mitochondrial Eve ancestor was part of a greater population, okay? Now, based on the low variation, even in the mitochondrial DNA, the Y chromosome, the low genetic diversity, they had to invoke a selective sweep. They invoked the population bottleneck because that would have reduced the homogeneity. If you're evolving from the Australopithecines into Habilis, into Erectus, Erectus is living in Africa for a million years, let's say probably longer. They would have had uh, their own out of Africa event. They say two out of Africa events. They would be accruing genetic mistakes, genetic mutations, genetic diversity. They'd have a lot of genes floating around a population of, say, a million strong, okay? Maybe even more. So we would expect high, high, high levels of genetic diversity today. Doesn't fit the data. They didn't predict it. Yes, they're going to come up with their storyboard. They're going to say that they got the math when, in fact, they don't have the math. We have the math. None of them have read the papers on Mendel's accountant. 
It's like, hey, you don't have the math. And then you give them a paper that shows the math and they don't read it because ignorance is bliss. But ignorance is not a virtue is the problem for the evolutionists. So here's the thing. They had to invoke the population bottleneck because that bottleneck would have, re would have reduced levels of heterozygosity, increased levels of homozygosity. That's how they explain the, the diversity today. All post hoc, all ad hoc. Okay. So notice a pattern here. Okay. What we see is that there's not a lot of mutations here and it's explosive growth from a center point. Okay. Here's the issue though. Here's the issue. When you actually look at some of these haplogroups, look at this, Europe. Okay. Uh, one of the most, if not, I believe it is the most common haplogroup in Europe, HVR. Notice, notice the branch lengths, the different sizes, for example. This means that there are people within here that are accruing more mutations, and yet they're all related to the same common ancestor. This is why it's a problem for the evolutionists to assume to assume the split and count up the differences and calibrate the data because what we're actually looking at, okay, especially on this tree, you can clearly see there's not a lot of mutations and you can see that the pattern fits exactly what we would expect. It's a reflection of only thousands of years and not hundreds of thousands of years. The evolutionists purport hundreds of thousands of years. Without the evolutionary base assumptions, the point is that the clear conclusion is that what we're looking at is a tree that is young. There's no evidence of, like Tony Reed says, a population, okay? And it just so turned out we're left with that one sequence, that one mitochondrial DNA ancestor, okay? And I like how um, Dr. Carter himself, he points out that um, when you look at the mutation rate, okay, when you look at any human family tree, take two people and say these two people that have the same great, great, great grandmother. Okay. Look at their mitochondria and see how different they are. Let's have a look at how many mutations they have. There is actually about an average of about one mutation every other generation. Okay. This means Right. This is all a reflection of time, DNA differences. OK, it, well, and that's the problem here is it's, it's, it's sporadic. OK, there's all the, the, the mutations here. Now it's, it's fast. And we had Dr. Carter a clip earlier. OK, but here's the thing. Given the known mutation rate and even given even given purifying selection, substitution rates, things that we need to consider important factors. This is only a few hundred generations. And that's what's fascinating. Okay. Uh, but based on what we know, based on what we know of the, the difference in branch lengths. Okay. You can't really assume the molecular clock. And that's the problem. Uh, let's, let's see, let's go back to his video. Alan Wilson of the University of California, Berkeley, and postdoctoral student Wesley Brown published work in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which demonstrated a rapid mutation rate in human mitochondrial DNA. Wilson and Brown observed that mitochondrial DNA mutated between 5 and 10 times faster than nuclear DNA at a rate of about 0.02 substitution per base pair per million years. As opposed to the billions of base pairs in nuclear DNA, mitochondrial DNA contains only 16,600 base pairs, which makes gene mapping much simpler. They concluded that this rate of mutation would be a useful tool in determining details about human diversity. Also in 1979, Wilson and doctoral student Rebecca Kahn began collecting samples from over 100 women of separate ethnic groups. After examining their mitochondrial DNA, in 1983, they had still failed to conclusively find a common ancestor. However, in the process, graduate student Mark Stoneking joined Wilson's lab for his PhD and aggressively sought out more and more samples, especially Aboriginal Australians, New Guineans, and Africans. The team realized that specific mutations shared at the same locations between individuals indicated matrilineal relations 
Championship, which Antonio Toroni of the University of Pavia would later dub a haplogroup. Within one haplogroup, there are even smaller groups which share another mutation. The mutations in the smaller groups are not shared by individuals in other haplogroups. Knowing this, a family tree for haplogroups can be drawn. Wilson and Can found that the highest hap... See, th this is what I would like um, Erica to answer. Is this major problem here? And maybe she does answer it in her... In her um, Wednesday video, but I really, 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 really want to hammer down the point that this haplogroup in Europe, the HVR, you know, and, and it sounds redundant, but it's very important. The fact that the branches have different lengths. This means that all the people here that go back to a common ancestor, yet in one group, as you can see here, there have happened to pick up twice as many mutations as their cousins. Here's my question. If we can pick up more mutations in the same amount of time, this means we cannot be justified. Okay, I'd like Erica to, to tell us how can the evolutionists be justified in looking between humans and chimpanzees and then making an assumption about when they split. Okay, they're going to say X million years ago, 6 million years ago, 8 million years ago. No, this is rand. This all of this. This is random mutations occurring in populations over periods of time. Okay. There's no justification. Okay. If she's in the chat, maybe she can give a justification right now. Give a justification. Let's see. Yeah. That, no, you don't have to right now. She says she's falling asleep. That's okay. But I just hope that these questions are answered because they often want to focus on the evolution storyboards. They don't want to focus on the fact that none of this was predicted. This is all force fitted, retrofitted. And these are the types of things that, you know, I would tell Erica to watch the debate that I had with this guy, Todd, outside Ed, who's been at this apparently for 20 years, former young earth creation. He didn't know any of this. This was all foreign to him. Why, though? This is the strongest evidence for our position. These former young earth creationists should at least be aware of the strongest evidence for our position. What we see is the pattern, a beautiful, beautiful pattern. The pattern, these branches all go back to a center point. Boom. Tony Reed just admitted it there. Mitochondrial DNA mutates fast. What we're looking at is one woman. He's got no justification in saying that this woman was, was a part of a population. No, 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 no. And then they bring in coalescence theory. You know, hopefully Erica asks the, answers the question and addresses the problem in that theory that has many of assumptions. One of them that I think is the worst assumption being random mating. That is not accurate historically. Humans have existed in tribes that have been separated. There's not random mating. You know, there's just problem after problem, but it's the pattern. It's the beautiful expected pattern. And then you got people like Jensen. And to Erica, I'm saying Jensen now. I know I said Jensen for the first year, but so here we go. Then you got people like Jensen that looks at this and says, this is a beautiful reflection of only a few thousand years. Let's make some predictions. If this really is a reflection of just 6,500 years, then we should be able to detect genetic signatures. We should be able to detect genetic signatures in regards to what? The history of civilization, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire. It should all be a reflection of that 6,500 years or else if all it is is noise because this really is hundreds of thousands of years, that means this. Our position, 6,500 years, it's like a needle, take a long needle. It would just be the very end of it. It'd be nothing but noise. You wouldn't be able to have any real genetic signatures, but the predictions are working. Why are we finding these, these signatures? So it's not only the, the pattern, it's not the observations, it's not the data. It's the fact that it's working, <laughs> that the predictions are being fulfilled slowly but surely. You know, these are active research programs. They cost money. They take a lot of work, but it's coming slowly but surely. Now, I don't expect Tony Reed is going to be able to refute any of this. So we'll probably just have to battle it out with, uh, you know, Erica and the crew. They make it fun. Erica, I was complimenting you earlier. We've had some great debates. I would say our three debates would be my three favorite. I like engaging debates, challenging debates, fun debates. Um, 
Uh, here we go. Haplogroup diversity in the world is in sub-Saharan Africa. Each of these haplogroups is as genetically distinct as the haplogroups from Europe, Asia, and the Americans. This indicates an Earth. Now I want to point out when Gutsy Gibbon in the chat, when she says that's an unrooted tree, what she really means is she wants us to still assume that we're related to the chimps. But it's funny because when you actually compare the mitochondrial DNA between humans, you can see it. It makes sense. It's always, it aligns. You can see that it's not messy. But when you add in chimps, it's, it's messy. There's problems. You, yeah, of course, when you put it in the computer, you know, they're gonna, it's going to align it the best. But you, you can't ballpark it. You can't see it for what it is. It's just so different. They want you to assume the chimp-human relationship. It's all circular, right? They can't overcome the basic presuppositions. They can't address the pattern. They can't address the few mutations that separate any two people on this planet from the mitochondrial Eve consensus sequence. If this is what I'm expecting to see Wednesday, all we're going to be seeing is a lot of assumptions, basic presuppositions, and storyboards, but not actually addressing the data and not addressing the fact that this tree, that it, all it is, is I said it at the beginning, I've said it a million times, it's human mitochondrial DNA, human mitochondrial DNA. So here's the thing. Um, Guts of Gibbons has enjoyed them as well. Yeah, Guts of Gibbons has been nothing but cordial, respectful, and it's been a fun back and forth and nothing but nothing but respect. And I often say agree to disagree because if it ever, if it gets to the point where it's heated, you know, oftentimes I can't tell you how many times I'll leave a comment in the heat of the moment, not to Erica, but any, any evolution. And I go back an hour later, I'm like, I'm going to delete that. You know, you want to just be as uh, you want to stick to the data, not resort to ad hominems and things like that. So, um, and what's funny too is, the whole rooting, the rooting issue, the rooting argument, that is an argument that I originally seen from, from Evograd. I just find it so funny that they want you to assume the split and the relationship when in fact, when you deal with the data without that assumption, it fits beautifully. You've seen the pattern, you've seen what is reflected there and it's not hundreds of thousands of years worth of mutations, that's for certain. Early diversification. This distinction occurred due to little or no interbreeding between individuals belonging to separate haplogroups. It would be unrealistic to assume that all of those diverse ethnic African haplogroups would originate near the Persian Gulf or Southeast Asia, diverge from each other, and then migrate together without interbreeding to sub-Saharan Africa. The more likely scenario is that the vast majority of the early descendants of mitochondrial Eve originated in sub-Saharan Africa and stayed there while smaller groups sub Now guys, because we've been going over a couple hours, um, there's only two more minutes of Reed's video. I've got notes on everything he talked about. There's a few things I need to address still on the out of Africa, the assumption of where they put their Eve, as well as the higher diversity seen in Africa. So uh, we're going to play the rest of it because we know that I can go on rabbit trails. So what I'm going to do, let's play the rest of it, and then we're going to deal with those issues. We'll leave no stone unturned. Subsequently migrated and became ancestors of ethnic groups outside of Africa. The results were published for peer review on January 1st, 1987 in the peer-reviewed journal Nature. So we can confidently say, with very little fear of refutation, that mitochondrial Eve lived in sub-Saharan Africa. Between creationists and evolutionists, the big question is not where she lived, but when she lived. As I've already mentioned, the evolutionary estimate is between 100 and 230,000 years ago, while the creationist estimate should be based on circular reasoning, calibration, not, use, not using the measured mutation rate, not using the empirical method. But we've, we've talked about that over and over again. But see, here's the thing. In Tony Reed's video, he'll slip by that, right? He'll, he'll make you think that this is all based on the measurable mutation rate be between 4,000 and 6,000 years ago. The genetics give us one very specific estimate. 
Between the most distantly isolated haplogroups, the team noticed a total difference of 121 base pair substitutions, taking into account the fairly steady established rate of 0.02 substitutions per base pair over 1 million years across 16,000 base pairs, and assuming that both haplogroups continue to diverge at the same estimated rate, we come to a figure of roughly 180,000 years, well within the evolutionary estimate. For the creationist estimate to be correct, the rate of mutation in the past would have had to be 30 to 45 times faster than its present rate. So the creationist assumption that all people share a single female ancestor is correct, but with the discovery of mitochondrial DNA, that very same confirmed creationist assumption demonstrates that creationism gets the place and time of that common ancestor dead wrong. And that's how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it. Okay, so I got a couple videos here. Uh, reading through the <clears throat> um, live chat. So if Erica is referring to the rooting of the tree in regards to Jensen's predictions, then what's funny is Jensen's pretty clear that he rooted the tree on the L node. And actually Jensen has, he's at least pointed it out to me and pointed out the fact that this was a clumsy mistake by evil grad because he indeed rooted it on the L node. But what's funny is the fact that the evolutionists, when you see what their justification is for where they root it, you can see how circular and assumption based it is. Now, this all goes back though, I want to point to the predictions that flow from what? The placement of Jensen's root. So he has placed it somewhere. So the evolutionists are just wrong. Evil Grad is wrong on that. But you won't see any predictions coming from Evil Grad, who that's where the argument originated from. It's basically just him saying, nah, -uh, doesn't work. Storyboard. You need to assume our position. So no, that yeah, that's that's just wrong. He he, he rooted it on the L node. So um pointed that out. Let's see what else we got here in the chat. Um <laughs> Atheist Jr., good to see you. Lena Powell. Okay. Oh, no, Erica said she headed out. So, yeah. She says the unrooted isn't, yeah. So, uh, when we look at these trees and the patterns, we're not assuming the human chimp split. But when it comes to Jensen's predictions and the three major haplogroups, L, M, and N, Jensen is clear that he rooted it on the L node. So, Unfortunately, that's probably going to be an argument then that we're going to see Wednesday, but uh, we'll, we'll correct it then too. Um, anyways, let's go to this clip here. Dr. Carter, we're going to go over the major issues now. We're going to end it here. We've been going for a while, leaving no stone unturned though. We challenged Tony Reid to debunk this video. He won't be able to. Um, but I'm also glad we got to deal with some of Erica's arguments too, like a sneak peek into our response to her video, whatever's in that video. So let's see some of these problems with the out of Africa scenario and some of the assumptions of genetic diversity, assuming that it was a greater population. Here we go. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Now that you mentioned that, because we know humans have incredibly low genetic diversity, like, like you said, and you're right, they, they don't like to uh, point out the fact that the, the, the allele frequencies and how rare they are. When it comes to them attempting to explain the low genetic diversity, Dr. Carter, it looks like they look to that out of Africa near extinction event. Yeah. Is, is, is that um, out of Africa near extinction event? Is, is that plausible? And, you know, what are some of the major problems associated with that? Since that seems to be what they look to to explain the diversity. Well, first of all, it's a uh, post hoc answer. No one predicted the right. out of Africa event before they found the data. And they're like, oh, what do we do now? Oh, well, what if our population is reduced to an effective population size of about 10,000 individuals? 
Now, could it have been reduced to 1,000 or 100 or 10? Yeah, but they don't allow that in their models. They only go down to about 10,000-ish. And what if that stayed in that size for a very long time? They never say how long, but a very long time. Well, then, according to mathematics, you're naturally going to have a Y chromosome atom. You're naturally going to have a mitochondrial leave, and most genetic diversity will be lost. Because small populations, the inbreeding, you get a lot of loss of diversity. That's why we have um, you know, breeds of dogs. It's because they don't let them breed with another breed. There's only, I don't know, how many German Shepherds in the world? How many St. Bernards in the world? Not many. There's a few thousand of each. I don't, I don't know. I don't know the numbers, actually. That would be an interesting question. But that will dictate to you how much diversity you have. The problem with this is this. There are about 10,000 cheetahs in the wild today. And all the population wildlife ecologists are worried that they're going to go extinct because. So remember this, they need to invoke a bottleneck. Cause as we explained earlier, millions of years of accruing genetic diversity, you'd have a lot of genes floating around. We'd have a lot of diversity today if deep time evolution was true, but we know we have low genetic diversity major problem for deep time evolution. So they need an extended bottleneck, not a one generation bottleneck like we have that is then followed by rapid and exponential population growth, preserving most of that genetic variation and not leading to any real significant inbreeding problems and deleterious effects. But for them, they require an extended population bottleneck a prolonged bottleneck where levels of heterozygosity are being reduced. But here's what's happening. All of these deleterious mutations that have been accruing for generation after generation are now manifested, leading to rapid and accelerated genetic degeneration. Okay, this wasn't a one or two population bottleneck. This would have been detrimental. This would have actually been an extinction event of epic proportions, but yet they want us to believe that out of this post hoc ad hoc story that man exploded out of Africa and seized dominion over the planet, this highly degenerated and inbred population. Do you see the issues? Do you see the problems? Let's take an example from today. Cheetahs have experienced a bottleneck as Dr. Carter is explaining. They are now down to 7,000. They are highly degenerate. Their sperm is degenerate. They've had all of these recessive mutations come to the forefront. They are on the verge of extinction. Cons conservationists are extremely worried. Are these cheetahs going to suddenly explode into all parts of the planet, seizing dominion over the world? No. No, in the same way that this... It did not occur in the out of Africa population bottleneck either. Deal with these issues, Tony Reed. Deal with these issues. Mutations are increasing. Birth defects are increasing. Litter size is decreasing. Reproductive incompatibility. Genetic diversity in cheetahs is going down, 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 down. They're too inbred. If they can't survive about 10,000 individuals, how did we? And if that inbreeding event is a near extinction event. We evolved from the primitive Homo erectus to Homo sapiens in a situation that should have driven us to extinction. Right. We went out of a near extinction event, okay, that would have been highly damaging. And now we're looking at humans today that evolved from this highly inbred population. We have learned to build the space shuttle, build cars, design extremely complex things, all out of this highly inbred, nearly extinct population. Do you see what a fairy tale this is? It's post. They never predicted it. If you put, you phrase it like that, all of a sudden you realize, like, wait a second, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and we, we went, we went from you know half monkey, half man to flying to the moon. <laughs> right. In a very short amount of time. <clears throat> Atheist Jr. in the chat says, and yet every single species on earth, including humans, should have a similar bottleneck to cheetahs if Noah's Ark is true. Do you see? Do you see how little the critics comprehend the young earth creation model? 
it is a fact that some species within a greater family where that family, okay, the felid family has high genetic diversity, but the species within the family, okay, cheetahs, all it takes is basic knowledge in taxonomy and classification systematics, okay? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. The cheetah species experienced a bottleneck. Many species do experience a bottleneck. And what happens in a bottleneck, what results is inbreeding. And <laughs> inbreeding exposes the hidden reservoir of genetic mistakes. But guess what? That greater family, the felid, still has high genetic diversity. And guess what? Guess what, Atheist Jr. and critics? There's a new study that came out that I bring up every debate and the evolutionist fails, okay? The DNA barcoding study where they looked at that highly, highly conserved mitochondrial DNA protein, the CO1 gene, and guess what they found? Low genetic diversity across all of the biological world. 90% of species, they said, all arose at the same time. They had to invoke a selective sweep. No, that's the Noah's bottleneck. That's the flood. How do you explain that there, Atheist Jr.? Probably won't get an answer. Just like I was asking those questions to Erica and we weren't getting any answer. Atheist Jr. doesn't understand bottlenecks. He doesn't understand taxonomy. He doesn't understand genetics. That's why his argument is just a face palm. Atheist Jr., how do you address the DNA barcoding study that says over 90% of life arose at the same time because of the low diversity in the CO1 gene? It's a highly conserved gene, which means, which means it's good to look at. Selection preserves it. So we can look at it and we see there's low diversity indicating all life arose at the same time. Then we see humans also have low genetic diversity. We see the 1Y chromosomal line. We see the mitochondrial DNA data. We see the mitochondrial DNA phylogenetic tree. We see the pattern that suggests one woman recent. It all correlates. So I doubt there's going to be an answer to that one, but the data is exactly what he's asking for. Now, some species... Some species. So he says, got a link. Yeah, let, let, let's go to the slide that I show almost every single debate. Conspiracy cats, Ron Garrett, the Todd debate. So here it is. DNA barcoding study. Where is it? We got a lot of, a lot of goodies here. In analyzing the barcodes across 100,000 species, the researchers found a telltale sign showing that almost all the animals <laughs> emerged about the same time as humans. Isn't that funny? And yet, another ex unexpected – it's always unexpected. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed? That's why they invented, invented this post hoc, ad hoc population bottleneck. That's why they invented coalescence theory which is based on some really bad assumptions. None of this was predicted, but it was exactly expected on the biblical creation model. Look at what this says. Look at this. Another expected finding in the study. Species have very clear genetic boundaries, and there's nothing much in between, it says. Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? Genetic boundaries. Hmm. Does independent origins ring a bell? One of the researchers, when you read the paper, Literally said, I fought the data as hard as I could. <laughs> I mean, gosh. And we're look, look, look at this. Human evolution being overturned every single day. Remember Australopithecus sediba they're saying is your number one transitional form. Oh, now we're seeing paper after paper, article after article. New studies shake up human family tree. Australopithecus sediba is unlikely to be the ancestor of Homo. Australopithecus sediba, not likely a, a human answer. Human missing link fossils may be jumble of species. No less clarity to human evolution. Look at this. Significant overlap in groundbreaking find. Three kinds of early humans unearthed living together in South Africa. Atheist Jr. won't even realize, won't even think to himself, hmm, why did Gutsick Gibbon have to get together with all of Team Dodgeball? Dr. Dan, Joshua Swamidas, Evo Grad, CRISPR, RJ Downer, Jackson Wheat, to take months to respond to our arguments. Their video is finally coming out tomorrow. 
But yet these arguments are supposed to be so easy to refute, but they got to get the whole team together. And then we are going to dismantle it sentence by sentence. Look at this. Australopithecus, Paranthropus, and Homo erectus all living at the same time. And famous paleoanthropologist Lee Berger has admitted that Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, is a chimeric species, a mixture of human bones and ape bones. The ape being specifically Australopithecine bones. Ah, that's funny. So according to the evolutionists, the way they have to argue, I was able to live before my great-great-grandfather. I was able to live before my parents. No, no, I ain't going to cut it. I ain't going to cut it. So um, let's get to the diversity or else we'll be there all night. But it has been fun. It has been fun. Um, let's see. Now, remember, this was a lot of the data I brought up to good old Todd the other day who's been at this for 30 years. Remember his responses? Oh, what did he say? He said, uh, I'm not going to fall for that trap. So um, let's see. I want to make sure we get all videos. So we've done this one. What is the best evidence? We've gone through Tony Reed's video. We've done the Erica clip where she flopped on the Y chromosome. We've done the outside ed clip. We've done the, the lecture, the lecture clip. And we've showed that one. Okay, so that means we just need to deal with the rest of the out of Africa issue. So I've been sharing screen here, can't really see the chat. Let's see how everybody's holding up here. Um, okay, let's see. Atheist Jr. says, yeah, no, it, Atheist Jr. says, surely I can't be expected to respond to the questions. Yeah, no, that's exactly the point. You don't have to. That's fine. But don't come in here with arguments that are what's called, okay, there's something called a straw man argument. It's where you use an argument against something that we don't even believe or purport, or that's a misunderstanding of the model. You know, that's not the proper way to, to argue. Um, now, I will say a lot of these studies, you know, I'll say it to the evolutionists, they are going to, they are going to invoke population bottlenecks, selective sweeps. But what's funny is we don't have to invoke these things because it's exactly, exactly what we would expect. Um, Brother Mitchell says, Doki is killing me. <laughs> is Doki in the chat, Mitchell? I don't see, uh, I don't see Doki. Hmm. Yeah, uh, Google uh, barcoding, Atheist Jr. Um, we like Atheist Jr. around here. Nice guy. Seems cordial. Maybe we'll, I'll be happy to have a discussion one of these days. Mitchell, thank you for the super chat, brother. Okay, so let's go over some of this stuff on the out of Africa, and then we'll call it a day. This is what's going to finish off poor Tony Reed here. So I'm just going to read some of these explanations. Before I read these, let me explain in my own words. Okay, so what the evolutionists are doing, what Tony Reed is doing here, is he's assuming that the more mutations and diversity in Africans is because they are an older population. Now, this is based on a number of assumptions. We know this. We discussed the PRDM9 enzyme as well that are found in more abundance in Africa. But the point is, they're going to say that Africans are an older population than non-Africans, and Africans go back further than 6,500 years. Okay? You can even see it on these phylogenetic trees. You can see that the African branches have longer branches than the non-African branches. But remember, they make assumptions about population history. They make assumptions about generation times. They make assumptions about recombination and gene conversion rates. They make assumptions about, I don't know, what else comes to mind? They make assumptions about the number of children various populations were having in the past. They assume away any hypermutating lineages. Um, one example I like to give is the fact that if a mutation affects the workings of the DNA repair enzymes, guess what's going to happen? More mutations will accumulate. And the fact that more mutations would accumulate would actually lead to divergence in population genetic differences. Because they'll point to the divergence and say, see, 
and all this proves deep time evolution, when in fact, it proves different mutational events, different population histories, for example, inbreeding, like with the Neanderthals, we know inbreeding is bad. You can get a rapid fixation of harmful mutations in small populations, of course. Um, when it comes to Africa, though, Africa is really interesting. Um, there's a there's a there's a paper actually that that shows that African populations were divided into small groups of people, and those small groups of people remain small, and they remain separated for long periods of time. So what happens under those conditions is those small tribes would then diverge, okay? They would di diverge rapidly. So what we're looking at is more fixated mutations. And the more fixated mutations you get, what happens is the more these populations diverge from each other, okay? This actually explains why Africa has the most genetic diversity. Africa, as uh, Tony Reid was iterating, actually has more genetic diversity than the rest of the world combined. <laughs> he, I can't remember what part in the video, but it's true what he said. Um, two people living in different cultural groups within Africa itself can actually have more differences than a European or somebody from China. Okay, but here's the problem. Here's the problem with their assumptions. All of their assumptions, the ones that I just mentioned, they've all been invalidated. Here's also something that's fascinating that I point out, and I point it out because I saw Dr. Carter point it out, and it's fascinating. The more we go away from the Middle East in any country in the world, do you know what happens? Genetic diversity decreases. Okay, this is because fewer and fewer people made it the further we go around the globe. Some of the most homogeneous populations in the world are amongst who? The Native Americans. Now in Africa, okay, let's go into Africa. If we travel south, okay, south in Africa and west in Africa, genetic diversity decreases. And guess what? Interestingly, the hotspot of diversity is right next to where we would say was the Tower of Babel. Isn't that funny? That means where we decide to put the center of genetic diversity is a matter of what? That's right. It's a matter of worldview differences. Evolutionists like Tony Reid here, they want to place it in Africa. But we place it in the Middle East where the Tower of Babel was located. And then at the Tower of Babel, we know God separated the nations according to their languages. And yet, not predicted by the evolutionists, Modern genetics has discovered a single dispersal of people groups around the world. And I know this is a mouth, mouthful, but this is the only way to properly destroy Tony Reed's argument here. Now, here's from a source. I'd highly recommend reading it. Logos RA. They point out that the out of Africa story assumes that higher levels of. So we're going to kind of reiterate, add to what I just explained the best I could. Um, let's see here how the chat's doing. Otangelo, brother, good to see you. Otangelo, I, um, <laughs> uh, Atheist Jr. just said, okay, so 90% of species arose at the same time instead of all of them. That's absurd. Well, see, what happened at the flood? Atheist Jr. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. These animals that came off the ark, they didn't just magically poof into existence at the time of the flood. They were taken, okay? Now, I would say God would have sent the most heterozygous pair of animals to the ark. But guess what? They weren't the only two animals on the planet at the time, Atheist Jr. <laughs> they were taken. They were taken from a greater population, okay? Two heterozygous equids or two heterozygous felids or canids. They were taken from greater populations of felids, canids, and equids. That's why it says 90%, not 100%, because that 90% didn't just poof into existence, okay? This is, this screams the bottleneck at the flood. And this is what the evolutionists always, always ask for. Wow, oh, where's the evidence that there was some bottleneck in the, in the history of the planet, like they like would be at the flood. 
So here's the thing. You know, someone like Atheist Jr., we like him, nice guy. But this is what evolutionists do, especially the newbies. They use arguments as if it's the first time we've heard it. <laughs> it's all been dealt with. I've dealt with all of these in my books. And I, I could literally just do an, an open mic night and have all these guys come in for 10 hours a day and just debunk all their commonly used arguments. So, but here's the thing. The argument he just used, if he would have just used his brain a little bit, he would have realized, yeah, that's right. That's right. The kinds that were sent to the ark, they were, they were sent from greater populations in the pre-flood world. Makes sense. 90%, not 100%. So glad he said that so we could deal with that one. Anyway, so let's read this here. Oh, Brother Otangelo, um, we, uh, I advertised for your debate tomorrow. So we're excited. I'm pumped. Otangelo is a warrior of the faith and destroys naturalism. So he's he's going to be here tomorrow. So let, let's get through this, guys. The Out of Africa story assumes that higher levels of diversity in Africa prove man came from Africa and therefore Africans are an older than other people groups, like I said. But African diversity can be better explained in terms of how human diversity was subdivided after the biblical dispersion out of Babel. The divergence of the people groups does not require a slow accumulation of mutations over time. The molecular clock but can arise essentially instantly by fragmentation of the source population and strong founder effects followed by assortative mating. People group divergence is most consistent with a very recent fragmentation of the human race. Um, Lena Pau says, I am very surprised that they published the paper about the barcoding. Normally they are silent about fighting findings that contradict evolution. It's yeah. And Lena, you get you get the best contradictions to evolution in their own literature. And then they got to back down on it and say, oh, you know, we're not. Because I believe that original paper, the Rockefeller study, they actually put a disclaimer now that they're not saying it contradicts evolution because they know it does. And people were complaining, which is hilarious. Um, so here's the thing. Here's the thing, the data that we have. So, for example, this paper from the Proceedings of the International Conference on Creationism, Adam, Eve, and Design Diversity, when it comes to mutation rates, recombination rates, what we know, the numbers, for example, they match up per perfectly to the uh, biblical creation model. We know here the PRDM9 controls activation of mammalian recombination hotspots. Turns out. Turns out that Africans have more, have more of these sites. And it just turns out that they have, that they can retain more higher levels of genetic diversity because why? Like Dr. Carter said, they have more of these spots and those spots help initiate those recombination hotspots. So the reason why they have more diversity and the reason why they have the appearance of more recombination events is not because they're older. It's because of the numbers of factors that we discussed earlier. Actually, uh, Stupid Horror Energy asked that question to me in the debate the other night. Let me see. I'm going to, let's look through the comment section and see if I, I think I actually timestamped it too. Um, so as you can see here on Standing for Truth, we, we go into detail. So we debunked... Um, we debunked CRISPR, EvoGrad, Tony Reed's comment that he thought was irrefutable on the Y chromosome. We refuted his video. Now, I want to say, this was one nine-minute video from Tony Reed. I've got a whole slew of his videos. He's going to be good business. I could probably do a three-hour video like this every single night debunking, look at debunking Tony Reed. Okay, let's see. This PRDM9. Let's see. Yeah, so if anybody gets that uh, argument that Atheist Jr. here used, you know, the, the why 90%, well, we know that they came from a greater population in the pre-flood world. And the whole attack that Erica just did on Jensen not rooting the tree, he rooted the tree. He rooted the tree. And predictions have flowed from that rooting. Um, okay, so, yeah, let's see this, actually. Maybe we'll end it with this. We've had some fun. Suggesting that there were are you suggesting that their recombination rates were higher in the past? Okay, so is that from Super? 
Oh, it looks like it's a little laggy. Let's see. It's had a busy day. Super energy. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, Super Energy is good. We've had <laughs> Super Chat debates on Chromosome 2 Fusion, so she is up on this, which is good. Now, here's the thing. The PRDM9 sites. <sighs> so we got to deal with this. So Atheist Jr. says um, – that the authors never claimed that most species came into existence within the past 200,000 years. So Atheist Jr., when you actually read the whole paper, and make sure that you read these papers without the evolutionary lens or presupposition. So what they're doing now is they're concluding, of course, that this low genetic diversity that's found in the barcoding, what they're saying is it's due to a selective sweep. Okay, they're going to invoke extinction events for this that would reduce the, the levels of heterozygosity, but they're not young earth creationists. So now what they do, like always with these molecular clock studies, they calibrate the dates with the assumed evolutionary history. Okay. That's the major problem though. They're not using the measurable mutation rates like we've stated. They're looking at the genetic diversity. Okay, that's why the out of Africa population bottleneck, they oftentimes don't even know. They don't provide you an exact date of how many thousands of years this was or the exact number. Some say 2000, some say 10,000, some say 30,000. I mean, they're looking at the levels of genetic diversity and then they're inventing their story. Okay, we look at the empirical data, but very frequently the conclusions of these authors they're very erroneous because they're based off the evolutionary assumptions. They're not going to question the paradigm. They're going to force fit it. They're going to retrofit it. But once again, it wasn't predicted. It's contradicted. Okay. Let's continue this. The, the, the papers that I was showing were the Africans where they have more of those sites and they have uh, evidence for more recombination. They have more genetic uh, Atheist Jr. says they are only talking about the genome of mitochondrial DNA. Yes, that's why I said highly conserved mitochondrial DNA. The CO1 gene is a mitochondrial gene. <laughs> you know, we understand this uh, this stuff. So, see, here's the thing, guys. Though this, you know, I like when the evolutionists join the chats because this is the best they have to offer. And if you notice, it's recycling and parroting the same arguments. Even Erica, who's supposedly their best, you've seen. I played a video clip earlier. I don't want to do it right now to poor Atheist Junior and show uh, how badly she flopped on the Y chromosome because she's his hero. You know, the evolutionists they want to hope, dream, and imagine so strongly that pine trees, whales, banana plants, and humans are related through common ancestry. They don't want to look at the empirical data. They want to blindly believe the conclusions of the authors, just like Erica is doing with the Y chromosome dissimilarity, just blindly accepting their explanations for the rapidly evolving Y chromosome and the loss of genes in the chimpanzee and whatever they have to do in terms of storyboards to fit the data. Otangelo Grasso says, Evidence that all animal species on earth today emerge at about the same time as humans. Exactly. Exactly, brother. Otangelo says it is not only in crisis, it's debunked. Exactly. Lena Powell says mitochondrial DNA is the easiest to study because it has less genes, far less genes than the nuclear genome. The nuclear genome has over 3 billion letters. We inherit two copies, 6 billion. Um, the uh, mitochondrial DNA, DNA compartments, only just over 16,000 letters. And those highly conserved mitochondrial DNA proteins, they're important, they're essential, selection preserves it. They're perfect to look at. And that's exactly where we found the low genetic diversity. So Atheist Jr., you try, I, I want to thank Atheist Jr. It was fun. You made this, this uh, stream more powerful, actually, you and Erica both. Because uh, we got to debunk more evolutionist arguments. So uh, this was really bad for Tony Reid, but now it's become really, really bad for him. If you guys notice tomorrow that Tony Reid shut down his channel, don't be surprised. Because this was a fatal blow to him. Um, Godzilla Freak says, evolution does make testable predictions. Falsified ones, that is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here, let's finish it off diversity 
And the evidence suggests, I'm pulling up the paper here. Here it is. PRDM9 controls activation of mammalian recombination hotspots. There's more hotspots in African people groups. That's why they have more genetic diversity. Now, here's the thing. Mutations actually break down those enzymes, those PRDM9 sites. That means in the past, you would have had more, and therefore you would have had more recombination. More recombination means that that population can retain what? It can retain more genetic diversity. And this is right from the secular literature. I got four papers here that, that talk about it. So yeah, in the past, there would have been more recombination because you had more of the enzymes that help control recombination and activate those recombination hotspots. So I hope that answered the question. Good question, though. Really good question. You can quickly respond to that. So as we can see, the data is on our side. It's a great time to be a young earth creationist. Tony Reed's video, I mean, didn't even stand a chance. Um, it's probably been almost three hours. I could do this all day. But, I mean, we've got so much here to cover. So much with the mitochondrial DNA, more evidence suggesting that uh, the, the independent origins model, um, debunking the rescue devices, coalescence. But, you know, we've at this point, it's evolution. It's it's hanging on nothing but our tax dollars, as Holden always says. <laughs> um, you know, here's a good point that I want to address. OK. Let's have a look at this. Since this was an, a direct claim from Tony Reed, let's leave no stone on. He's not going to be able to address it. He's done. Okay. But let's let's just let's uh, icing on the cake. It is widely claimed that the molecular clock shows that mitochondrial Eve lived about 120,000 years ago. Remember he said this? This calculated date has been around for very many years and is very outdated. Look at this, outdated just like Tony Reed's arguments. It is based upon many tenuous and convoluted assumptions, including a mutation rate that is now known to be 10 to 20 fold too slow. Remember Tony Reed said we have to invoke unrealistic mutation rates? Where is he getting the, everything he says proves he knows nothing about this topic. They're the ones that have to invoke a mutation rate 10 to 20 fold too slow. By simply correcting for the erroneous mutation rate, mitochondrial Eve have lived would have lived just six to 12,000 years ago. Why haven't they corrected the 120,000 year old date since we have known the correct mutation rate for a long time? Our own analysis, which simply assumes a relatively constant mutation rate, indicates that the average modern human being differs from the Eve sequence by only 22 mutations. Even assuming a mitochondrial mutation rate as low as 0.1 per generation, it is actually closer to 0.5, but we assume a significant amount of purifying selection. So when people like Dr. Dan Dan, the pseudoscience man, says that we don't account for the necessary factors, give them a ton of purifying selection. Give them a ton. And guess what happens? Eve still lived only 220 generations ago, between two and 300. Assuming human generation time of 25 years, this comes to 5,500 years ago. This is remarkably consistent with the biblical perspective. And then we can do the same with the, uh, we can do the exact same thing with the Y chromosome. We can do, um, here's the thing, guys. We didn't have to force fit the data. We didn't have to post hoc, ad hoc, rationalize everything away. Erica is going to come out with a video Wednesday and it's going to be nothing but storyboards. You can already see based on her arguments in the chat. If, if her video was so good, why didn't she answer any of my questions? You know, she said she's tired and maybe she is, but still, you know, we're not expecting much and we're going to point, we're going to point out all the storyboards. Let's end it here. Let's end it with this, with this source too. More icing on the cake, basically reiterating, you know, what I've said kind of in my own words, but, you know, corroborating it with, with some PhDs who really know this topic. So let's read. Some have argued that a consensus Eve sequence, right? Evo, Grad, CRISPR, um, Swami Das, Dan, Erica, copying them. <laughs> so let's see. Have argued that it, it should be expected, even if there was no literal Eve, based upon what is called coalescence theory. 
Trying to use coalescence theory to explain why all humans came from a single woman who was not Eve, but just what Tony Reed said, but was a member of a large population requires many unrealistic assumptions, right? We talked about it earlier, random mating. I think they talk about it here. Let's see. Most importantly, global coalescence requires maintenance through deep time of a single unified breeding population with perfectly, there it is, there it is, random mating. The coalescence calculation fails when given biologically realistic conditions where there are isolated subpopulations, aka tribes. See how they need unrealistic conditions, unrealistic assumptions to get their uh, the, the evidence to, to work within their model. The reality is that historically people have always been separated. They've always spread out, distanced themselves from competing populations, sorted themselves into tribes, and preferentially mated within local populations. Obviously people in Australia in ancient times were not normally mating with people in Africa. This means evolutionary coalescence cannot realistically be applied globally in terms of early mankind. We pointed this out to Dr. Dan Dan, the pseudoscience man, two months ago. No response. He, you know, we're very disappointed with Dan. He came in as the savior and he flopped. They brought Todd in as the savior. And well, you know, that spoke for itself. So let's see here. <clears throat> Uh, in, in early human history, isolated tribes clearly diverged from each other, producing race-like differences, which would have resulted in the preservation of whatever mitochondrial diversity might have been present in the beginning. This is key. Refute this, Tony Reed. It is actually very unreasonable to expect a clear evolutionary Eve sequence, given what we know about human reproduction. We're going to end it with this, guys. Because this is all they got to offer. Atheist Jr. proved this tonight. Erica proved it by showing up in the chat. And Tony Reed proved it. He didn't even have to show up in the chat and he proved it. There we go. Evolution storyboard. That's all they got, guys. So um, Lena Powell says, random mating, absolutely unrealistic. You know, it's, it's sad. And Lena, I've been seeing your comments. You are doing a great job refuting these guys. Um, I've, I've saved a few of your papers that that you pointed out and posted. So Brady D makes a really good point. If we are off by a few years, it's just a few years. But if they are off a few years, they are off by forever. Yep, absolutely. When it comes to their their dates for Eve, you know, like it, they're so far away. <laughs> from where they need to be, that everything they need to invoke is just so unrealistic, so unscientific, so pathetic. Anyways, since this was clearly a fatal blow to Tony Reed, um, he, poor guy. Good sport though, good sport. I want to thank Tony Reed for making that video because by him making that video made this possible. Doctrine of fair use. So the challenge is out there. Tony Reed's going to have a lot of work to do before he ever wants to promote such garbage science. Such garbage science. So here we go, guys. We're going to end it with this. David Neff versus Otangelo Grasso tomorrow. Intelligent design versus naturalistic evolution. Be here. 8.30 EST. It's going to be a lot of fun. And Saturday, Genesis Flood Debate, Nephilim Free versus Derek Barnes. That's going to be a lot of fun too. So it's late, guys. I want to thank you so much for sticking it out. Godzilla Freak, everybody. Lena Powell, you guys stuck it out the whole time. That's awesome. Hope you guys, uh, if, you, if you guys noticed anything that wasn't addressed, try to address everything. Let me know. Shoot me an email, something like that. So uh, Godzilla Freak says retired. Yes. Yeah. Tony Reed has earned retirement. So guys, thanks for sticking it out for the full two and a half hours. But typically that's how long we take with these guys because as we say, <laughs> they say more things wrong in one sentence than words in that sentence. So, and to be honest with you, with the amount of data I got and prepared, we could probably go for another four hours. But I think this did it. I think this did it. We missed Doki Doki though. I hope Doki Doki's doing okay. 
Doki Doki is usually the life of the party. Brother Mitchell, thanks for being here. Thanks for staying up. Mitchell says, good night, bro hands and sis turkeys. <laughs> awesome. Brady says, keep standing for the truth. Thank you. God bless, guys. Uh, I appreciate the support. Appreciate you guys sticking it out. Um, Otangelo, go subscribe to him. He's awesome. He's got some good posts here, good articles that he's put out. So, oh, this, this is good. Otangelo has reason and science, evidence that all animal species on Earth today emerge at about the same time. So go check that out. And we're on the same page, Otangelo. Anyways, guys, till we meet again, we'll see you tomorrow. I had a lot of fun. I hope you had a lot of fun. And God bless. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started.